Welcome to DAX Machina. Join us as we explore the mysteries of this world. Cryptids, monsters, macabre tales, and horror stories abound. Could they be true? Are monsters real? Good evening, folks, and thank you for joining us for another edition of DAX Machina. Appreciate y'all being here tonight. In the studio tonight with me is Robbie Rip Reigns, host of What's Really Out There, and Carrie Pocket Dog Davis, my pint-sized brother from another mother, founder and owner of Dark Angel Medical. Boys, how the hell are you guys tonight? I'm doing pretty good. How about y'all? Wyatt, I am rolling. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were going to say that or say if you were going to say it ain't got no gas in it. Ain't got no gas in it. <laughs> I was expecting one of the two. How much you want for them french fried taters? Mm -hmm. I've been studying on killing you. <laughs> oh. I'm doing good, man. I'm above ground and in front of the bars, so it's a it's a good day. I, I hear you. So uh, it's been, been an interesting week. I mean, you know, we... Uh, yeah, we, we've all been busy as busy as hell. Um, book the uh, the new book is proceeding in pace. I'm well over forty thousand words into this new book, uh, but it's probably going to come in heavy. Uh, I'm figuring by the time I'm done with the story I want to tell for the first one of uh, of the dark dark frontiers, it's probably going to be much closer to a hundred thousand than seventy thousand. Fun, and, and I'm gonna tell you, and I, and I said I was talking talking to one of my friends today, and I said he gets better book by book by book. And I ain't saying that to blow sunshine up your kilt. It's just one of those things that uh, it, that it's the truth. And from everything I've read so far that you sent me, and Robbie will agree with this. Holy crap, y'all yeah. are gonna do it. Well, and it's a lot of it is as each book goes by, the universe just keeps getting bigger and bigger, and you've just got more things that you can sample from and put in, and more characters that you introduce that you can. Play thing. It's there is just there is so much that you can do with this that will that, that will but you springboard into the and, the other series. The, it, it's just it's yeah, mind blowing. I'm, I'm already that. laying those little spider web tendrils yeah, leading up. And if you I'll say this: if y'all are Wild Hunt fans, this is going to be like the origin story, y'all. So y'all will absolutely 100 percent love it man it is going to be it, it's 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 freaking awesome everything i've read so far has been two thumbs up so well i uh, i just sent a just sent an email out just a few minutes ago so you guys should have the 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 you two should have the most recent update they're nice it's nice it's nice how much <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I'm working on throwing in some good banter for uh, for the assembled uh, older characters. Uh, I'm pretty proud of a couple of lines that uh, that Mr. Obadiah Davis has. <laughs> oh Lord, I can't read. I can't wait to read about my kin, <laughs> kin folk, my kin folk. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Yep. So, so what are we doing tonight, man? What kind We're of show? Talking about the skunk ape. Mm. The Pepe Le Pew ape. I had a family member that had an encounter with them. Really? Well, do tell. Uh, down in Sissimippi. So, uh, the, the Crooked Letter State. Uh, indeed. And uh, he didn't tell anybody about it. I hope you don't get, get pissed if he's watching. Keith, I love you, and I'm not trying to dime you out, but I'm diming you out. Uh, he didn't tell anybody about his encounter for a decade because he called me one night after one of our shows. He texted me, said, Hey, I know it's late, but do you have a minute to talk? And I said, yeah, absolutely, man. Always. He said, and he told me about, it. he said, I've never told anyone about this for fear because he's a, he's a physician. And he's like, I'm, I'm for fear of being stigmatized and called crazy and things like that. Uh, but he had an encounter. It was, it was a peaceable encounter. Uh, Thankfully. Thankfully, but otherwise he, he might have been a missing four one one. But he had a he had an encounter nonetheless, and it's it's one of those things where he did he just he said I didn't tell anybody. He said I don't feel I didn't feel comfortable talking about it until I watched y'all watch the show y'all tonight. He said so I'm gonna tell you. So I was I felt I felt honored that he was he felt comfortable enough to tell me, 
uh, first and foremost, uh, but he had been holding that in for 10 years. You but know? that right there shows that we're doing what we, what we set out to do. Absolutely. Giving, giving people that safe space where they can tell stuff about it and not have to worry about somebody saying, you're crazy. Because yeah. I was the same way. I went probably, what, 30-something years, DA, what a DA that we figured out. Mm -hmm. Not telling anybody, but my family. Yeah. Because I didn't want to be called crazy. Right. 100%, man. Okay. Like, like Y'all know what my said, saying is. Being crazy by yourself ain't no fun. <laughs> well, like DA said, in the job you have and the job he had, you start talking about that stuff, you can go, go in for a whiz quiz, you know? Because they're yeah. going mm -hmm. to think, think you're smoking them left-handed cigarettes on a regular basis. And I've been so, dipping into the evidence. The devil's way. Exactly. But it, it's 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 uh when he told me that, uh, I was I was like, dude, that's that's amazing. I'm glad you I'm glad you shared that with me because you needed to get that off your chest. He said, yeah, actually I did. So yeah, he had an encounter with one down in uh down in the swamps, of Mississippi. Oh, uh, Abraham, who was it? Uh, let me see here. John Abraham, did you get the email I sent? I did not, sir. Uh, DA, if you can throw him my email address up again. I'll check my spam, uh, and I don't know when you sent it, but I will check my spam and then just send it to me again. I ain't trying to hijack anything. I just want to answer that real quick. Oh, no problem. Well, Chairman Mao Zedong, uh, it's, it's my brother, actually. It's my brother. So, uh, yeah. Chairman Meow you know, is your brother. No, no, no. He was talking about, he said, well, if, oh. if Doc's cousin is crazy, then we're all crazy here. No, it was my brother, actually. And, and I mean, he's, he's my, he's, my two brothers are my best friends. And, uh, it had, and he didn't, he held that in for over a decade. And so, and I told him, I said, how many other people out there, based on their job experience or whatever they do, they might be in a high profile job or holding that kind of, um, that kind of information in that they've had these experiences for fear of being stigmatized. Yep. Yeah. I'm sure a lot. lot of the stories I've collected have been from people that are a lot that were very adamant about, Hey, I'll tell you this story, but I don't, I don't want you to ever tell anybody I told you this. Well, and I, I think honestly, like the shows that we've done where we've read first, we've read firsthand encounters have been some of our best shows because it allows these people to share their, their stories without fear of stigma, stigmatization. You know, right? Exactly. So it, it's pretty cool. So anyway, and to me, that's the best part of of, of this is is the feeling like we're we're giving somebody a voice where it's something that they'd repressed for, like you said, in that case, a decade. But you know, in Robbie's case, when him and I first started talking, when he told me his encounter, you, you he repressed it for for thirty years essentially. You know, he only told a very few, you know, very small handful of people, and uh, I think to, that is exactly the kind of thing that we set out to do with this show is when we started really leaning into cryptids and, and, and telling stories and, and, and sharing encounters. I think that's, that's kind of exactly the, what we were hoping to accomplish. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, for me, read uh, when I read that, you know, the, the first book that I read out of DA's series was the first wild hunt book. And I never thought reading that book would have me sitting right here helping other people that have that or had that same anxiety or have the same anxiety that I had. And that's yeah. to me, yeah. that's fulfilling because I know how that felt to hold that in for so long and not want, you know, when people, you know, you be standing around people start, you know, one of the messing with Sasquatch commercials come on and you hear people, <laughs> people are so stupid that believe in that. And you're like, yeah, yeah. And you're like, yeah. Right. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, Keith. When Keith was talking about it, he was talking to me, and he's like, he was he was like you, Robbie, and like Fred. When Fred comes on, every time he tells that story, he relives that incident. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Keith, Keith was like, "Dude, I'm." He said, "I'm I'm getting chills even telling you about this." Well, you know, cause I'm you thinking, know, that's actually changed for me now. I still relive it, and I yeah. it still, but it does not bother me nowhere near as bad because of being able to actually get on here and talk about it so much and you know just being able to get that off my chest and get that out of my system and have that outlet to talk it's now it's just like 
Yeah, it's a cool experience. But before this, it was just like, and I don't know if it was, honestly, I don't think it was the creature that was, it, the original one, yeah, obviously that scared the living daylights out of me. But years after that, it was not the creature that scared me so much talking about. It was fear of what people were going to think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now, you know, I just, I don't, I don't care because I know how, you know, 132 people watching us right now and none of them are judging me because they either believe or they've seen and are in the same book. And it just, it is so, I hate to use that term freeing, but it is, it, well, it just, that's, that's the right word for it because you've, you've had, you have, uh, unburdened yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and uh, we got a we got a uh, appreciation uh, chat from Fly by Stu for ten pounds. Thank you, Stu. Appreciate that, man. Much appreciated, brother. Appreciate you. Miss Naomi says I hit it for decades, but over the last couple of years, I've been a- been asked to retell it several times. For me, it's gotten a lot easier with every telling. Yeah, it has. It's. Well, I mean, it's still in my psyche and in, in that subconscious that uncommon uncanny valley thing that we always talk about but it doesn't bother me as much because right like i said you know even knowing what i saw you still so many people tell you you're crazy you start doubting yourself in, at certain times yeah absolutely but the more you get to talk about it here and people are like man yeah what about this did you see it yeah i did see it oh man i saw it it, it just yep. yeah yeah it like so much- it's, it's therapeutic every time he talks yeah. about it it's it's a therapy session for him yeah and i think yeah. that's i think that's important to to get to, to get these things out in the open and get them off your chest and uh, well, you know, you know, as, as a say, cop i kind of compare these to critical incidents uh, yes. You know, they they encourage you when you're involved in a critical incident to to sit and discuss it with somebody. Now, even if it isn't a, a psychologist, it just talk about it with somebody because you can't you can't bottle that in and and you know and, and not have it affect you pretty deeply. Yeah. Uh, you know, because when someone sees sees uh, something like this out in the woods, I, like I said, I consider it a critical incident because it is a world changing moment for most people. Yeah, it changes yeah. your your perception of reality. It, well, it's no doubt. And Anthony and I were talking about this one time. We it, one early morning, and he was up. He just come in from work. He called to see how, see how I was doing, and we just got to talking about this. And we were talking about, and I know both of you know what I'm about to talk about about the uh, PNS backlash and mm-hmm. the adrenaline dumps and things like that. I the, it's. That is tantamount to that. I mean, it's the same thing. You say something like that, you're gonna go through the same thing as you do if you if you had, as a military person or a law enforcement officer, you had to pull your gun and shoot somebody, or you go through some, seeing something like this. Especially if you don't have any inkling of believing it, and you see it, and your reality just gets snapped like that. It's the same thing. Yeah, you're gonna go through that, you know, parasymp- parasympathetic uh, reaction. And the SNS backlash and all that stuff is going to happen. Right. Uh, Blue Crossroads says, my supernatural encounters do not bother me as much as the critical incident calls throughout my career. And, and, and everybody everybody is wired differently, but I, a reason why I likened it to the critical incident is like those of us who've been in the community, we're already got that mindset where we're expecting something like that. But somebody that's just, you know, not expecting a, a world changing event because they went fishing uh, you know, that's that's a paradigm shift that is setting our entire world on on its ear. And, uh, you know, that, that's why I was com- making the comparison, because it's it's one of those things that, you know, not everybody is is really wired to handle. Um, and I, I don't want to I don't want to make that sound, you know, sound bad. Uh, but, you know, not everybody's cut out to be in the military. Not everybody's cut out to be a cop. Not everybody's cut out to 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 face something like that and walk away with with just a shrug. It is yeah. going to deeply affect people. Yeah, it, it you're not going to no matter how strong your uh, your uh, you uh, how strong you are emotionally, physically, mentally, whatever, you're not going to walk away from any kind of encounter like that unscathed. Period. No. I mean, even if it's 
even if it doesn't really, you show it doesn't affect you, or act you act like it doesn't affect you. Even on a smallest minute level, it's going to affect you in some way, shape, fashion, or form. You know, just like DA's talked about people he's talked to that were lifetime hunters who have had these encounters who never stepped foot back in the woods again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I know guys that they were done. They don't need them. They, they don't even go hiking. Yeah. And that no. might, that might be an extreme, but like say Fred's case, it didn't affect him to that extreme, but it, it affected him where he, he's like, yeah, I'll take you in the general general area, but I ain't going back to that exact right. spot. Right. Right. Look at that animals. may not be as extreme as some of the, I'm done with the woods completely, but you know, and Anthony, Anthony's very similar to that. He's like, yeah, I haven't yeah. gone hunting since. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, all right. Sorry about that. I, I, I wasn't trying to take us off onto another tangent, but uh, I think I, it's I, part, I think that is perfectly fine. Yeah, I, I don't think, think, I think that was completely in line with tangents. I think that that <laughs> goes perfectly with. I, think I, I agree. I think it's important for people to to feel free to share. And this, like like we've always said, this is a uh, non judicial zone. You know, this is a this is a, a good place to 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 air it out and talk to people because we're not going to we're not going to judge we're going to be we're going to listen to you uh fairly and impartially because your experience is your experience it's like i've always told my kids your emotions are your emotions and what you feel is what you feel just like what you experience is what you've experienced and 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 those calls those, those have their own emotions attached to them so y'all come on in and talk to us yeah uh, flying over over at Monster Radio says, D.A. Axmex mocking a podcast. I'm hoping to start either a novel or a comic book verse with cryptids. Would it be okay if I were to base a character off you? Dude, I'd be flattered as hell. That would be awesome. <laughs> That'd be cool. That would be cool. That would be freaking awesome. Have a graphic novel. That'd be even more awesome. -er. Oh, hell yeah. More awesome. -er -er. More awesome. Awesome. -er. Awesome. -er -er. Oh. Awesomeness tenfold. <laughs> so, what do you boys think? You know, when we when we hear stories about big about Bigfoot, and then hear when they when they change the well, not necessarily change the description, but when the the term they use is skunk ape instead of say Bigfoot, do you think it's a distinctly different type, or is it just regional adaptations? I mean, go ahead, Doc. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think it's regional adaptation. Uh, I mean, you have different species of cats, bear, things like that. Um, I mean, it would it would be naive to say that they're not going to have their own regional ad adaptations to their own areas. Um, so because what does that do? Their regional adaptations enable them to have a greater ability to procreate and survive. Right. So yeah. I, I would I would say it's a regional adaptation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think we kind of hit on that uh, Wednesday when we was talking about the grass man, talking about you know structures because that specific type of grass is there, and that's what they make those structures out of. So therefore, it's called the Ohio grass man, just because. And I, I, when we did our uh, Norman Johnny and I did our show on types of Bigfoot, or no, excuse me, not types of Bigfoot. It was the Tennessee Wild Man show. There was some people were describing what could have been a gugway. Some people were describing even with smells were calling it a skunk ape. Some people were describing what even could have been a Janoska. And it, it's I think I think there's a like Doc said regional ad adaptations, but I also think there's like we said different species of them. So if one person sees the skunk ape in this area and the, the most uh, key feature to that thing is the smell or they get close enough to one where the smell is the key feature that it's, they start calling it the skunk ape. But then somebody else sees a different one, but they've heard this. It just starts getting all tied in together and you get certain areas where there's the thing like the Tennessee wild man, which is, it's, they're probably just seeing different types of bigfoots that, because we all agree that they that they travel, they have a big area. So, you know, just because this one is in Ohio does not mean it doesn't go into Mississippi or 
Right. I don't think they area. recognize state boundaries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, yeah. Well, no, oh, oh, that's Arkansas. We don't go yeah, into I, Arkansas. I don't have my there. Tennessee driver's license. I can't go into Tennessee, so I'm gonna stay in. Right. In Ohio. That's, I mean, that's, that's right. Mississippi. I got warrants, man. Yeah. I got right. warrants. Can't, can't go there. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Stephanie Estet Beatty has a really good question. Uh, from a, I think it's from a psychological standpoint. Do you think non-believers have a harder time after they have had an encounter? I think so. I mean, a lot of the people that I've talked to that, that were firmly in the camp of that's that, that's just a that's just a myth. It's just a you know ur urban legend. They can't possibly exist, and then they see one. To the, to to me, though, those are the encounters that the people are the most shook up. Uh, and one of yeah. two things generally happens: either they just want to you know forget it happened and and pretend you know or and and probably never go in the woods again but they don't want to talk about it they don't want to admit it happened or they become obsessed and want to know more like this thing's out yeah. there what else is out there well because yeah. it, uh, it changes their perception of reality at that point right you know I, and so that's, that, i think that's, anthony that's, that's, falls into that category yeah because yeah. he was an adult when he saw it and it 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 opened up that, you know, that paradigm shift we talk about. And right. Anthony went from not believe because he was, he firmly did not believe. He thought everybody that believed was crazy. Then he has his encounter and all of a sudden that light switch is turned on and he went, Oh, what else is out there? I want to, I want to, I want to know everything yeah. I can about these. Yeah. And, and so well, uh, you, the opposite effect. I want to say thank you to Travis, uh, Tra yes. Travis Drum for the, thank uh, you, Travis. For the super chat, appreciate it, sir. Thanks, Travis. Uh, Rich, Richard Cox had a good comment. He says, "No such thing as a non-believer. Once they see one, they become yeah. knowers." Well, and it, it's like my oldest brother uh, is—he's always been somewhat skeptical about paranormal stuff. Well, I've experienced paranormal stuff, so I'm a knower, you know. And and uh, and I told him, I said, and he said, "Look," he said, "just because." I haven't experienced it doesn't mean I don't believe in it. It's just, I haven't experienced it yet. And I think there's a lot of people who may fall in that category where they're not, they're not non-believers. They're just kind of on the edge, on the cusp. And then if something happens to them, then they're like, like he just said, they're a knower and it, it changes their whole perception. Jimmy G says, I think I'm in the obsession camp. Just watching this show for a while has made me want to dive head first into the woods. <laughs> Well, be careful. Yeah, be careful and take you a good med kit. Uh, Growing Old with Purpose says, I'm a budding screenwriter. Would you ever consider having someone write a screenplay on some of your stories? Uh, under the right circumstances, it would be, but it would be have something we'd have to discuss a great deal because there's there are some places I would not want to submit the books uh, simply because I know they would ruin them. Uh, I, so when it comes to my intellectual property, I want to play it kind of close to the vest. Uh, I, the, if the production company that did say um, um, the terminal the, the list, terminal list, so yeah, they did, or, or the one that did the Jack Ryan, not, not Jack Ryan, Jack Reacher. Jack Reacher. Yeah, if, if the, one of those two companies, I would be down. But for the most part, what Netflix touches turns to crap, um, and a lot, and mostly with with Amazon too. So I would be very careful who I would I would I would let get a hold of my intellectual property. Yeah, because a lot of times, like you said, man, they, they bastardize so much, you know, and it's, it's disappointing. Yeah, I think Hulu does a really good job on most of their their things. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, going back to the uh, to the people and how they react and the different camps i guess will be a a good way to put it i think you know you got the people like anthony who it shifts that perception of reality of okay i went from one minute thinking these things didn't exist next minute i pull up my rifle because i think i whatever i think they were hunting hogs that night and i'm looking in the face of something that reminds me of a human. And then you got the people like DA talked about that. It, that's just Okay. Yeah, they're real, but I'm done. I'm, I'm never going back it. But I also think there's a third group and that's the people who are like in the heavy, 
they weren't in denial in the first place. They were just, I, I don't think it's there. But then they see something like that, and then they just start doubting anything that they see or, or, nah, that, that it, it was pareidolia. You know, I, I, I didn't see what I think I saw. I saw, and, and they, they go from being somebody who's like, well, I just don't believe it exists to, you know, really hit. And I think those are some of the people that can kind of maybe hurt the field. Maybe not the worst, but can really hurt it because they're the ones that, uh, that really rely heavily on those red circle pictures to mm-hmm. show that, see, there's nothing there. That say I, I it's just, it's just branches. That that's what I saw. So when you they start spreading that rumor and stuff like that, I I think stuff like that hurts yeah. the. Sorry, that was kind of a weird thought, but it's just <laughs> I think those th- that third group is the kind that kind of hurts the hurts the cause the most. Yeah, and th- what's that girl from uh, Finding Bigfoot? What's her name? Renee. I think yeah, she, I can't remember her name. I, I think she falls into that category because you know there's been there's been some things on that show that I can't explain that I, I that it may be somebody out in the woods do it because we all know what the reality shows do, but she's always the one that's trying to explain everything away, even though her explanations sometimes make absolutely no sense. But she's always trying to explain. Oh, it's this. It's that. It's that. it's never. Well, that could be. It's no. It's not. Richard Cox has a good point. Says rationalization is a human defense mechanism. Yep. yep. I was just about to tag that one. Absolutely. We try yeah. to rationalize everything into what our perception of our reality is. Yeah, and that's that's that was what I was. I couldn't pull the word rationalization out. So thank you, Richard. But. That that was my point. They they yeah. try to over rationalize what they saw. Oh, it couldn't have been this. It had to be right, right. shadows right. and a stick. Right, because because it's when something like that happens. Uh, you know, and I'm basing this on my paranormal experience. It's so surreal that you're like, you know, your rational mind is sitting there going, "There's no way that that just happened. It's got to be this or it's got to be that." But then. The other side of your mind is going, no, I'm pretty sure that happened because I was here when it did happen. You know, so so you're just gonna have to you're gonna have to deal with it. And it's it's uh it's it's definitely something. It's it's a it's an emotional or a mental obstacle that a lot of people have to get over. And I Uh, think a lot of the times when when you see see one of these things as an adult, that's what what happens. Like for me, being a kid when I saw it, I was able to accept it a whole lot easier than somebody who's had a lot of life experiences that's already so closed mind or closed minded that they're, they're absolutely positively no way right that this can exist well, as a i kid, know everything that exists already well as a kid you don't have that prejudicial thought right you know and so it, it's one of these things where you're you're more of a uh, clean slate whereas as we get older and we have those life experiences like you're talking about you know we're like eh you know, it had to have been something else. So yeah, exactly. When it when in fact it wasn't, it was exactly what you what you saw, you know, or what you experienced. Well, and and kids are going to trust themselves and what they see more than than adults are sometimes, which is is bad to say that you know because we've got life experiences as adults, we should trust what we see and yeah. our perception and our. Uh, our senses more than we do, but we're like, like you said, we try to over rationalize it and reason it away instead of just saying, huh, well, you know, Occam's razor. Right. I saw, I saw a Bigfoot that I had to be what I saw, but no, exactly. it's, take it at face value, man. Yeah. It, it, had to be, it was swamp gas reflected, reflected from Mars. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was a weather balloon, but it wasn't Chinese. No, no. Yeah. It was just a weather balloon. I was actually, a buddy of mine was just texting me from Montana. So he was uh, he was filling me in on some of that stuff. So pretty interesting stuff. So, DA. Yes, sir. What is a skunk ape? Let's talk about that. 
a skunk ape seems to be the variety that has primarily seen in seen in Florida, but it's also been described at, in you know pretty much all the the, the southern swampy states. Um, if you uh, want to look from basically the the swamps that run almost unbroken from Louisiana, well, East Texas, from East Texas to the tip of Florida, uh, you know, it, it's it seems to be that type of of a more aggressive type Sasquatch, even though they may not be quite as big as the ones that are described in the Pacific Northwest, but they're the swamp dwellers. Uh, I think it's possible that the Honey Island Swamp Monster might fall into that category, as well as the Falk Monster. That's what I was just about to say, because yeah. if you think yeah. back to Legend of Boggy Creek, a lot of those people talked about its smell. Yeah. Like rotten eggs. Yep. And that'd be the sulfur smell you'd get out of some of them sulfur bottoms. Well, and... And up here in Greenville, where uh, Norm and I went and or have been doing that uh, investigation where Johnny brought us to, that was one of the I, I felt I smelt that wet dog, rotten meat, almost sweet fruit smell. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like they travel. Yeah. And see, my brother, I asked him that night that it happened to him. I asked him if he smelled anything because I was curious about that. He said, no, he said he had a, he was out by a fire when all this happened. Um, and he said, no, he said I was upwind from everything. And it was about 30, 40 feet away from me uh, when he saw what he saw. And uh, so he didn't really smell anything. What cued him into it was all the night sounds stopped. Mm -hmm. you know? And that's what he was like. He was like, you know, he did a Hank Hill, you know, what the hell? And uh, all of a sudden, he was like, uh, "Damn it, Bigfoot! Damn it, damn it, damn it, skunk ape! What are you doing? Get, get that off your head! You're scaring Ladybird, you know." And uh, so he started. Uh, he 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 started looking around, and that's when he saw it. And uh, it was. Uh, he said, "Yeah, I didn't smell anything, but it was it was the absence of night sounds, all of a sudden, because it had been so." You know, it's a down there in the swamps, of Mississippi. It's a cacophony, you know, big word for redneck, but it's a cacophony of uh, of night sounds, and all of a sudden, yeah, you know, nothing. And he was he was like, "You're ever out in the woods, and it goes from goes from the night symphony to absolute quiet. That is a butt pucker yeah. moment." Yeah, and that's what that's what kind of cued him into it. He's like, "Whoa, something ain't right here." And uh, that's what it was. But he was upwind. That's the reason. I don't think. I think that's the reason he never smelled anything. You know, I think in some cases, um, I think that rotten smell might be uh, like a scent gland. Um, like but then you've got all these sulfur, these sulfur bottoms too. You know, but and and for years, I mean, for hundreds of years, Native Americans have been using those sulfur sulfur bottoms as a way to repel insects. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the you know, funny thing is, is there's a lot of those sulfur springs uh, right down here in, in northeast Oklahoma. Uh, if you go, like my wife's got cousins that li live in uh, in Tulsa. And, you know, sometimes we would we would just drive down because she likes to go down to uh, uh, the uh, the casino there in, in Tulsa. And uh, she also, there's another one she likes in, Cho in uh, down in Choctaw country, down in uh, Durant. Uh, but we'd stop and eat at some of these restaurants and uh, water down there has a real, real strong sulfur flavor to it, like tap water at a restaurant. Yeah. Um, and you can smell it, especially at night. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting, uh, you know, because I remember my grandma's well water had a really strong sulfur smell to it. Yep. You know, when I was growing up. So, yeah, uh, Two Shadows said something about that. The faucet smelled like sulfur. Uh, Blue Cross wrote this question. Has anyone theorized that the smell may be attributed to a Bigfoot going through puberty or some type of mating period? That's entirely possible. Um, yeah, however, Dr. Dr. Jane Goodall noted that in, in the behaviors of mountain gorillas, that at times they, they had, I believe that they were under their arms. I can't remember where, but there were times when gorillas would leave this really pungent smell behind. And it, it was almost like a territorial thing. Hmm. So it's it's hard to, it's hard to say. Uh, it, you know, we again, this is an, an, an unknown creature. We don't know. Uh, it very well could be. I mean, it just you know, it, it, uh, at this point, we've got theories, and that one's just as good an explanation as any I could come up with. Yeah. Uh, Richie Harris says, "Are there any stories of people surviving a skunk ape attack?" Um, there are people that have had their vehicles attacked, had stuff thrown at their campgrounds. Um, 
But the thing is, is, you know, you go missing in the swamps, it could be any number of things. It could be, you know, the greater North American murder log. It could be a nope rope. It, <laughs> there's a lot of things in the swamp that'll kill you. Uh, and people do go missing in the Everglades in, in, uh, in, out in out Louisiana. So it's hard to say what's making some of these people disappear. Uh, but these things are pretty notorious for aggressive behavior. Uh, not necessarily the attacks, but more like bluff charges and throwing stuff at people. Richard Cox says, I survived a cougar attack in a bar one night. <laughs> I just saw that, too. <laughs> Those are ambush predators, man. <laughs> yeah. When things get you, they won't let go. <laughs> oh, my oh, gosh. <laughs> I love that. Uh, Ryan over at Monster Radio says, it's called chemical signal, and you're correct. It's a gland located in the armpits. It's used to deter other males from their territory. I go. knew I remembered reading that. See? Dr. Jane Goodall for the win. There you go. Uh, DA with the three ball. <laughs> that's right. I'm too chunky to be uh, Larry Bird. So where's the... Uh, has there About been... the right weight, but I'd need to be a foot taller. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'd be like three feet taller. Um, what's the... Uh... <laughs> Shut up, Rob. <laughs> um, David Bice says, I'm too old for cougars. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 an old married fart. I'm afraid the only cougars that I, that I'd attract are the ones like in the old Bugs Bunny cartoon, or Pete Puma. <laughs> uh, the only cougars what? to be chasing me was saber tooth tigers because they're extinct. <laughs> well, uh, what what's the uh, what's the latest uh, skunk ape data, BA? Well, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of uh, researchers uh, down in Florida. We've had a few of them here on the show. Um, uh, Nona Boss. Um, uh, uh, oh, God dang it. Uh, John Blank. Jessica, uh, Jessica Jones is investigated down in Florida. Um, the Mid-Florida Bigfoot Research Group, they're down there. And I'm, draw I'm absolutely just having a brain fart moment draw recalling names. I'm horrible with names, folks. So if I forget your name, I apologize. But that just... Just how I am, but uh, there's a lot of researchers that that work in and around the Green Swamp area. Um, the the late Kerry Arnold worked down there, uh, gathered a lot of good data. Uh, and one of the uh, things that a lot of them seem to be coming up with are those clear hair shafts we've talked about so much. Ken Gerhardt is pretty is pretty prominent with the skunk ape too, isn't he? Uh, Ken has done stuff on the on the on the uh, skunk ape, but he lives in Texas, so most of his stuff is like the Pacific Northwest. And, I, and I'm not saying that's not that's all of it, because uh, Ken and Lyle Blackburn have both got in gotten into the. I think Lyle's the one I was actually thinking about. I think Lyle does more with the skunk ape because he's he's big involved with the uh, the Falk area. Uh, in fact, the guy that owns Monster Mart, uh, uh, my cousin Mr. Roberts, uh, <laughs> uh, Lyle actually does all of the t-shirts and the vending in that store yeah I, it's probably it probably was lyle that i was thinking they're they're they do a lot of stuff together too don't they <laughs> yeah yeah they do blue crossroads cracks me up <laughs> that's, that's, that's that police humor right there yeah that'll get you uh, growing old with purposes. I've heard a lot of different names for this creature. There are these names for different ones found all over. There are actually different kinds. Um, you know, I think when you start looking at, at the types of Bigfoot, and we've done a show on the type of big types of Bigfoot before, and I want to do another one and update that list. Uh, Robbie, uh, they did one types of Bigfoot over uh, what's really out there, and it was it was a good little show. You guys should check that out out on his channel. Uh, but you know, you know, we're I've kind of expanded on that list since he did that show and then we did ours. Uh, I want to get uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan Paul Tremblay from Over Monster Radio. I'd like to get him on the show. Ryan, if you're listening, uh, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, I'd like to get him on the show and and go more in depth on the, on the types of Bigfoot from around the world, not just here in the United States. But you know, there are some re researchers that believe there may be as many as ten different subspecies of Bigfoot on the North American continent, and for the most part, I would agree with that. Um, where I where I, where I uh, disagree with some of the quote unquote experts is when the when they start talking about the seven types of dogmen, because I don't think the first three are really dogmen. Uh, but that's another story and another show. Um, uh, and Linda Bryant says announcement Connor will be at our Oxford Bigfoot conference this summer. That's awesome. Cool. 
Congrats. Uh, did I have I missed anything? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Ryan kind of kind of got us that answer there. It says uh, there's a lot a lot to name. Some of the names do describe variations among them, and some of them I, I believe are regional adaptations, and then some of them like the Gugway I think are a, a separate subspecies entirely. Uh, I don't think the Gugway I think the Gugway is about as related to the other species of Bigfoot as it is the dog man. I mean, the Gugway is just yeah. kind of its own thing, uh, and it's. When you start digging into the lore of the Gugway, that goddamn thing is freaking terrifying. It's like, I, like what I like to refer to as nightmare fuel. Um, well, I mean, it's just like saying a baboon and a gorilla are the same thing. They're both primates, but they're completely different. Right. All right. So let's let's talk about physical characteristics, DA. Um, All right. Size wise, are they roughly the same size as some of the the Western Sasquatch? Now, the, the reported size ranges for skunk apes tends to run a little smaller. Uh, average seems to be between six and a half and seven feet. Uh, some even reported smaller, you know, five, six, five to six feet, which was, those could be juveniles or they could just be smaller species. But the thing about it is, is if you're going to live in a swampy environment like that, it's really not conducive to the big eight, nine, ten footers. Uh, the big ones like that are probably going to have much more difficulty existing in that that hot of an environment and that that wet of an environment so okay, i would yep. say when you start looking at at localized adaptations i would say the skunk ape tends to run smaller i love where it seems to tend, make up for that in aggressiveness all right so when my brother saw what he saw uh it was the eyes the eye shine the red orange eye shine mm -hmm. was was about a foot over the cab of his, his truck and he's got a chevy 2500 hd so that's, so, about that's a good-sized six. critter. Yeah. Oh. When, when you get when you get into Florida, there are people that report sightings of skunk ape, and then there are other reportings of regular Bigfoot. So right. I think these things have have an overlapping certain amount of territory. Okay. Uh, I don't think you're going to see the really big ones farther into the swamp, but I think at that edge where swamp meets meets hard ground, I think you're going to have an overlap to an extent. Because there's a lot of food, a lot of food yeah. possibilities in a swamp he's, area. He's got he's got several hundred acres down there, and it's a, it's a hard bottom flat with a couple of creeks and some swamps. So that could that could relay that. He didn't well, see any tracks because there was pine straw and leaves everywhere, and it hadn't rained in a minute. Yeah, so. it, just just like we've always said, to look at these things and study them without actually being able to see them. What's the easiest thing to do? You look at other animals, right? And mm -hmm. so, crocodilians. A saltwater crocodile is probably two to three times bigger than a than an alligator. Yeah, same yep. family, but you're not gonna find an alligator twenty plus feet, right? But you're right. gonna find you're gonna find well, plenty of know, salties that that big. It is possible. I think the record yeah, that was I mean, caught. Uh, down, I want to say in Louisiana, I believe the record was 17 feet. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a, they had a 19 footer that was in captivity at Gatorland. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be condition, per, perfect conditions, being fed, n no predators, no you know, not having to worry about any, any stuff like that. You're gonna have stuff like that. Yeah, there's, but in the wild, you're not typically. I I guess I should say typically, you're not gonna see a 20 foot a 20 foot plus alligator. Right. There's always going to be an anomaly. There's always that, that chance of anomaly there, yeah. genetic anomaly or whatever. That's pretty much an average for a salty, you know, yeah. anywhere yeah. from 19 to 22 feet. The, you know, when you start getting up into 23 foot mark, like Gustav and some of those, the big uh, right. Nile crocodiles and big salties like that, you know, obviously that's that's getting on, on up. But, you know, look at the sharks. You've yeah. seen a 22 foot great white, but that's an anomaly. But you you don't typically see a mako, which is related to a great white shark. You don't typically see a mako much bigger than than ten foot, which is a juvenile great white. Which is which is still terrifying, right? Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> just saying, um, yeah. So so da, um, what about? And this could be something with a territorial overlap. You were just theorizing about. What about footprints? What about casts? Because we've got three toes, we've got five toes. 
and, and, and that's another weird thing. I don't know if that's a, a subspecies or if, like you were saying, uh, or was it Robbie was saying about possibly one or more toes not making an impression? Uh, so I don't, I don't that, know if it's well, an we actual... Could, we could have a lizard man that's... Very well. Yeah. Uh, so, I, again, I don't know. It could be a result of inbreeding. It could be the result of just a genetic uh, genetic aberration it could be because it, you know it had a couple of them bit off by an alligator uh, without again without having specimens to study uh, all we've got is theory on this and i think that probably the most likely at least in my mind would be you know because it's a in an area like that and with further encroachment by humans they've probably got a small breeding population uh, okay. so it's very likely a mutation caused by you know, them dipping into the gene pool a few too many times. Yeah, everybody. everybody uh, Queen of Osean, Queen of Ocean says, when did the AI have eyes shine around them? It's an animated background. It's on my green screen. Uh, my buddy Adam made an animated background, so it's the woods with eyes behind me. I thought it'd be creepy for the show. Kathy, Kathy Arnott had a funny one. I was just going to say this, too. Hammer toe. Yeah, hammer toe. <laughs> I was thinking about that, too. I said, they need a good orthopedist. They need to go to the Good Feet store. That's right. That's right. <laughs> An oversized podiatrist. Yeah, that's that's funny. And so uh, that that's a good point about the uh, about the small gene pool. You know, everybody different from the same can of Copenhagen uh, type of thing. So uh, it's a uh, it's interesting though because you hear some reports like the Fox monster uh, and the Honey Island Swamp monster. Those were all, if I remember, they were three toed. Yes. Uh, Honey Island was, yes. And some of the footprints for the Fout Monster were the, the ones that was found in Willie Smith's bean field was all three toes, but there's a lot of other tracks from that area that were regularly five toes. You just in the legend of Boggy Creek, that's really the only ones that they that they focus on are those that were that trackway through the big and it was because it was a nice big long trackway. Uh I believe DA, correct me if I'm wrong, when it was showing the scene of the two fishing right before the the attack at the house. The track that they saw that was regular five toed track, wasn't yeah. it? Right. So oh, again, it, it could be uh, you know a, 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 a genetic fluke, or it could be a different subspecies operating in that area. Uh, but the ones that around Falk, I believe, had five. Uh, so I, I think there was a couple of them that they found were three toed. But if I remember correctly, but some of them were five toed as well. Yeah, and I want I want to say that they uh they kind of touched on that in Small Town Monsters in their uh their little documentary on it, and I think one of the guys said that that was one of the few trackways that was ever found around there with with the three toes. Mo I believe that guy that they were talking to said most all of them were five toed, just like regular, and I think that was one of the few trackways that they discovered that actually had that. Hey guys, mm -hmm. I gotta take the old man out for a second. Uh, okay, I'll be right back. Not a problem, Doc. Uh, Queen of Ossian says, "Guys, do you you do know we're just scratching the surface of all this Bigfoot alien theories?" Exactly. Right at this point, really, all any of us have is theory, uh, and anybody that claims to be an expert in this field is lying to you. There mm -hmm. are no experts. Uh, there are some people, like I, I would say, could make a far better educated guess than others. Uh, Dr. Jeff Melvin being one of them, as the guy has a PhD in primatology. If he if he says something and he believes believes it is that way, yeah, I give his opinion a great deal of credence. It doesn't necessarily mean I always agree with it, but I give his his opinion on on things a great deal of weight. Um, and then there you know there, there are other times and then you know, when you use your own judgment and you're like I don't know if I buy that one, but Again, all we we are no real experts in this field, and and anybody that says otherwise is selling you something. Seeing if I missed any questions, sorry. I think there was a there's two starred comments. I don't know if you saw any of those. Oh, Miss Neoma's heading for bed. Good night, Miss Neoma. Thank you for being here. Hmm. Uh, Stephen Bishop says, do you think skunk apes adapted to the swamp enough to where they had 
enough, had enough height to hide underwater if need be compared to Bigfoot needing to be taller and broader to blend in with its environment? Now, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we, we do know that concentrations of Bigfoot sightings seem to occur around large clusters of caves. Um, and we know that we know there are caves in Florida, but a lot of them are submerged. But that doesn't mean that farther back in that cave, there aren't po large pockets of air, if not completely dry caverns. Um, so it's entirely possible that the reason why these things are so hard to find is they come out to forage and go back into some of these subterranean caves. Um, again, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there as a possible theory. Um, and also the Everglades are very, very thick. And uh, just how many people really get out into the deep part of the Everglades. Uh, it is a very unforgiving environment. Um, well, even up in South Krakalaki, where uh, where Rip here is from, uh, the swamps aren't as aren't as aren't as big as they are down in the, down in the um, Okefenokee, but there's some pretty hairy places out there too. Oh yeah, some I've places I wouldn't want to go. Well, I mean, just I've, think about that. Think about that. Where Lance was out there hunting that alligator, and they were in what what I say two feet of water. And there was a 10 foot alligator right underneath their boat in two feet of water, and they never saw it. Yeah. And that was a big rascal. Mm -hmm. What'd that thing, what'd that thing weigh? Several Five, hundred pounds. 500, I think, is what he said. 450, I would, 500. Pounds. I would not want to have that thing less than two, you know, two, three feet away from me and not know it's there. Uh, Richard Cox says that gets back to the cave dwelling troglodytes Richie mentioned. Uh, yeah, they. I think in a lot of cases that that not only do they, they uh, Bigfoot, and this is across the country, not simply uh, in Florida, but I think we, we start talking about the skunk ape or any of these, I think they are 100% are using caves. Uh, they could be living in them. They could be using for, for traveling great distances uh, because we know for a fact they found – they found connections in caves in the Mammoth Cave section in Tennessee and, and uh, Kentucky, and they believe that some of those caves might go as far as Maine. And I've heard recently there's talk of some of the, some of the deeper caves connecting to the limestone caves here in Missouri because we know those caverns go deep, way far. Well, even the cavern that, that's open to the public down in Silver Dollar City, that, they've been exploring that cave for 100 years, and there's passages they haven't followed. And that's a publicly, you know, publicly uh, open cave. And uh, one of the weirder things about that cave is, is while they do have it open for tours, uh, they take tours down there every once, like once an hour at Silver Dollar City. Uh, when I was an officer down there, I worked the overnight shift, you know, pr uh, you know, patrolling the park to make sure there was nobody getting into the park after hours and, you know, and double checking locks and stuff like that. But I worked uh, at, at, as an armed officer down there and we were forbidden from going into that cave no matter what we heard. Hmm. Yep, I remember you telling that story. We were not allowed to go into that cave, into that cave, no matter what we heard. Yep. It, it's quarter they, past they, half uh, time to get the hell half, out. Half time to get the they, hell out of here. Yeah. They they tried to say that that it was you know air quality issues or something like that, but the cave is massive. Okay. I I can't say there's going to be and they take a tire tour through every hour, you know, all day long, but suddenly when it gets dark outside, the air quality gets bad. Well, all the people that they took through through the with the tours throughout the day have breathed up all the air and that's, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah, they breathed up all the air. Yeah. Those air last couple of tours got a little sketchy. They didn't breathe it all up, doc. Yeah, air's gone and somebody had chili last night. So, yep. <laughs> There's too so much it's got to, in there. It's got to take Give the whole prices. night to, to circulate to refresh. and percolate yep. and get on out of there. Dude, Dave Dave says, and you only see a little bit of that cave on the tour. That is a solid point right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Richard Cox says, nobody would have to forbid me. He ain't going in. <laughs> well, I'm right there with you. But there were a couple of times we heard stuff down in that cave. Like, there's not supposed to be anybody down there. And I, I grabbed my flashlight and started to head for the entrance, and my lieutenant's like, hey, right, hey, we're not allowed to go in there. I'm like, what the hell do you mean we're not allowed to go in there? Did you hear you not hear that? He's like, yeah, I heard it, but we are forbidden from going into that cave after dark. Nope. That's funny right there. <laughs> it was probably it was probably Northwood's ex-wife down there. Probably. But it was. McDuffie81 says Spelunker Sasquatch. That's funny. 
That's hilarious. <laughs> but you know the um, yeah, the, that's just a just one example of of a of a cave that they still you know after almost a hundred years of them you know taking tours through it and 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 exploring this cave they still don't know where it goes. And uh, you know yeah, as a crow flies, we're pretty far from the Mississippi River, but. God knows how far those passages go, the deeper you get. Because like we like we were saying, when you're talking about doing uh, doing spelunking, it's not like you can just, you know, like you're going to visit someplace in, in the Amazon and you can have an air, aircraft drop supply caches for you. You can't do that in a cave. You've got to go in, pack in everything you need, set up a base camp, go out, bring in more supplies, equip the base camp, and then strike out from there, set up another base yeah. camp, and then make those hops multiple times. And generally, if you're going to send a team really far back, it takes multiple teams to support them because they're constantly going back and forth running the supplies for these further and further base camps. Well, it's just like that. It's like that podcast Cam did about that uh, 26-year-old female geologist. Do you remember that one, D.A.? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, and and she and that was one of the ones where they were finding backpacks and bones pretty well, for like three days were, into the cave. Yeah, and they were deeper than any human had ever been. And they were finding greenery, guns, backpacks, clothing, bones, all kinds of stuff. Her team got chased. She lit out it basically as a distraction, and she ended up. And I, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but she ended up in another state. Like yeah, she came, they later. went in in Tennessee, and she came out in Georgia. Yeah, so I mean that's. That right there shows you how 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 deep those cave systems run, and and like we were talking about all the missing four one one stuff, you know. Look at cave systems. Look at national parks. Look at disappearances. If you do a triple overlay, it's actually pretty compelling evidence that hey, they use the caves. Yeah. Yeah, we and, put that map up several times. And yeah. while we were talking about the the uh, the use of the. Uh, of what, what people refer to as wood knocks may possibly be for some form of echolocation. Yeah, we, we, we talked about that. Uh, like you mm -hmm. said, you can pop your, you can do a, you can do that mouth pop pretty loud. And that, that's not even trying. That's just, you know, just a, just, if I put my hands up and really let it go, it gets pretty loud. Yeah. So David by dot bongs. No, they're, <laughs> they're not Colorado, man. It's not Colorado. <laughs> That's funny. Colorado <laughs> grass apes. <laughs> there you go. Hemp Weed apes. apes. The hemp, yeah, apes. hemp apes. Hemp apes. That, that's even better. <laughs> the freedom of squatch. Oh, Lord have mercy. That's funny. <laughs> uh, Mr. Duffy81 says, I've never heard a whoop, but I have heard samurai chatter and heard a female speak out to me. That's interesting. Yeesh. That's pretty wild. I'd like to hear more about that, man. If you want to want to reach out to me, uh, my email address is daroberts at daroberts.net. Uh, yeah, I would love to hear more about that. Um, but, you know, the, we, we know from the uh, the Sierra sounds that they're capable of, of vocalizations and what the Navy did classify as language. They also said that they that their their vocal range is it exists both above above and below what we're capable of producing. Yeah. So. You know, they're making sounds we can't mimic. Um, and I think, and, and again, I, I don't think there's, you know, Bigfoot just walking around with a Louisville slugger over his shoulder, you know, you know doing the Morse code taps on the trees. I think they're doing it with their mouth. Uh, and over a distance, it, it's going to, it's going to sound, it's going to sound solid. Well, do the, do the skunk apes do that? Do they have, do they have what kind of signaling or, or calling or whatever? What are, what's been the uh, information on that? Now, uh, some of the researchers that are that, are, that work down like in the in the green swamps, uh, they've reported whoops. Uh, they've reported you know tree knocking behaviors. You know, ones we would typically expect expect of Sasquatch, um, but you know you don't hear as much about the bluff charges down there. Uh, you do hear you hear about a lot of a lot of people having stuff thrown at them, or being you know being screamed at until they abandon a camp. Uh, you know what we would typically consider as an express as a uh, aggressive, more territorial display. Not necessarily a lethal display, but an aggressive display to make people leave the area. Think about chimps; they throw things at, at people or other animals that enter their territory. Gorillas do bluff charges. Uh, orangutans generally will tear 
trees down. Gorillas do that too, I know. But you yeah. know, you got different type of territorial displays from known primates. You know, just, yeah. It, it it's it's just it, it's interesting to me the the characteristics that you know the like you see these videos of the trees shaking in the woods and things like that, and that's a that's a known primate behavior. You know, so what other behaviors do they share? And, you know, down, down south, the skunk ape, um, besides the size difference and, you know, some of the genetic anomalies, we might, we might say, um, you know, do they, do they, uh, do they pursue people like some of the Northwestern um, Sasquatch have? Not in the same way. I mean, you know, uh, what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, if I could spit it out, is, you know, traveling that quickly through a swampy area is much different than yeah. if you were in, in some place with solid ground. Uh, but there's still, you know, uh, people that have been out in, in the in the swamp have come back and found, you know, items left on the hood of their truck or, you know, handprints on the windows, like just letting them know we know where you we know you we know where you came yeah, from. We here. know where you're at. Right. That kind of thing. Well, in. And two, you know, the wood knocks or whatever you, or, you know, the popping echolocation, whatever you want to call it, that may be how they're communicating or in doing their echolocation up in the Pacific Northwest and things like that. But the whoops and hollers are usually talked about more over around this, you know, the mm -hmm. east coast area, you know, out in the swamps where you're in a, a lot more open area. Maybe a whoop or a holler would, you know, would would carry a lot more. Yeah, yeah, and those, especially in those, in those, those, uh, those flat bottom hollows down there, mm -hmm. carry through the swamps. Like it's just like it's like when we were kids. Our mamas used to holler at us, and we'd hear them from a half mile to a mile away. You know. Yeah. Yeah. When it's time for supper. Yeah. Um. Another another characteristic of, of the uh, of the skunk ape that I seem to seem to um, well that I find most interesting is there are cases much like uh, what happened in Falk where it reached through the screen door, uh, but it doesn't. Uh, but it, you know it, it, they hesitate at glass, uh, and I'll get more to that in a second. But they've I've heard several stories of them sticking their arm like like through the screen on a tent, like tearing the screen and sticking their arm in tents. Uh, which, you know, I think that's a brown pants moment right there if something's reaching into my tent. Uh, but there was one guy who was basically slapped awake by one when it reached through the, through the window of his pickup where he'd been sleeping. Nope. Uh, yeah. You know, he basically knocked him out of his seat, and when he realized what it was, he decided that was time to, to vacate said premises. Uh, but, you know, the, the, it's, a, it's a, something I'm you know, we're noting is an unusual behavior in Bigfoot across the country, not necessarily just the skunk ape, is you know like in the Falk incident where it shoved its arm through that screen door. The house didn't have uh, didn't have a air conditioning. This was way back in the day, and it was an old house. This was just an old swamp house, and it stuck its arm through the screen while that guy was on the on the on the on the toilet and probably relieved whatever bowel obstruction obstructions he might have had at that particular moment. I would say he cleared he cleared leather pretty fast on that one, but. The, you know they they will will reach through screens, but they stop at glass. Uh, you almost right. never hear a story of them breaking a window, and it makes me wonder why. Do are are they confused? That. What's that? Let's hear it. Because this happened to me on a call one night. I got an alarm call at a church, and as I was walking around checking the you know the exterior of the church, I looked down and I thought I saw an open they had, had like a basement level and you know how you get those uh little windows but they got the enclosed you can see about that much of the window there's like yeah. the brick around yeah. it and stuff like that yeah. so it looked like it was open so as i bit down i reached down to see if the window was open the window wasn't open and as i reached down the reflection of my hand looked like it was reaching towards me Oh. I thought something was inside reaching back towards me. So I jumped back. So if they're in the dark and they go reaching for a glass and they see a hand reaching back for them, maybe that's a hesitation type thing. Cause it, it made me hesitate. Cause I thought so, 
until well, I it, stepped back and reasoned out what it was. Right. It's kind of like those videos you see of cats and dogs, you know, barking and growling and hissing and spitting at themselves. It's you a know, when, they, yeah. when they see a mirror. So mm -hmm. it could be it could be very much the same thing, especially in a dark environment, because that's gonna act like a mirror. That's a good that's a good point, Robbie. That's a real good point. I have a mirror once in a while. I mean, I, I'd still poop my pants, but I mean, you know. Oh, I just about did because it scared <laughs> it scared the bejesus out of me. You're like <laughs> you're drawing down on it, you know. So <laughs> what the hell is that? Oh, that was me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, David Michael has a great question. Uh uh, DA, why are oh. some species more aggressive than others? What's the most dangerous? I would say if you had to pick one that's the most dangerous, uh, I would say either the Gugway or the Genosqua. Uh, and, and simply because much like bears, uh, how different types of bears uh, you know behave, the Genosqua and the Gugway both are like the, the meat eaters of the group. They're, uh, they're not... Uh, they're not the ones that are going to be, you know, uh, you know, eating berries and, and, and eating roots. These things pretty much exist entirely off of meat. In fact, the name Gugway means face eater. So, you know, just the fact of these things being out there, uh, I find absolutely freaking terrifying. Well, what's that? Is it a headless valley? On the Nahani Valley? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the Nahani Valley, they, uh, every, and I think this may possibly be Gugway activity. Um is is uh, an area in Canada, uh, in one of their national parks, where every time you know people go there, like uh, to camp or to explore, uh, when they find them, they generally find the bodies missing the heads. Well, that's not terrifying at all. No, not even slightly. Time to go. <laughs> what do you want, old man? Sorry, my dog's being super needy tonight. Not a problem, man. I uh, I accidentally hit some sort of keystroke and i don't know what i did but i lost my screen i'm trying to <laughs> trying to get my screen back raggy. yeah i don't know what i did lay i think down, i just got it lay down bro okay now we're back i don't know what i did but <laughs> i tore something up bam with da uh Stephen Bishop says it makes me want to read Lake View Man all over again. Yeah, I, I was I was trying to do something else and and, and hit hit the wrong keystroke and I don't know what the heck I did. I mean, <laughs> y'all know me. I'm I'm not the computer guy. Me either. But uh, you know, when, when you start talking about the, when you, when you start talking about the the more dangerous ones, uh, immediately the names of the uh, of the Gugway and the and the Genosqua come uh, more to mind. Uh, and, you know, used to be the only reports you heard of the Gugway came from farther up north in the like in Canada and the northern states. But there have been Gugway sightings as far, so far south as the big thicket country of East Texas now. Uh, and I think that a lot of uh, a lot of shows like like ours and a lot of the other shows that are profiled what exactly what a Gugway is. I don't think it's necessarily that the Gugway have come farther south is as people are starting to know the difference. Um, no. anytime you had a big hairy sighting of something in the woods, people just assumed it's Bigfoot, but now people, you know, people are starting to learn that the one that's had one that has a snout is a different one. And it, it, it's a lot less friendly than the Patterson Gimlin one. Uh, so, yeah. you know, I think that may, may account for why we're getting Gugway sightings farther South, uh, because, uh, you know, these, these things are, are your typical meat eaters. I mean, yeah. using bears as the perfect example to describe these things, you know, like the most most of the lower 48 Bigfoot, like the Patterson Gimlin, Gimlin and even the Skunk Ape to a degree, uh, are like black bears. They're omnivorous. They'll eat roots and berries. They'll eat you know you know you know shoots of plants. They'll they'll you know they'll eat animals if they get the chance. Uh, but you know they're more omnivorous in their diet. You yeah. know, when you get a little farther north with like the grizzly bear, they rely a lot more on heavy proteins. But they'll still browse and eat, eat berries and stuff like that. And you run into the big, the big boys, the co the polar bears up north. Those are just meat eaters. That's all they eat. They, they don't eat plants. They don't. They don't. You know, they eat fish, walrus, seals, slow Eskimos. You know, they they've got a pretty pretty broad diet, but it's all meat. Yeah, this would that be an Eskimo this, pie. <laughs> yeah, pie. 
this ain't your this ain't your uh this ain't your uh your your freaking uh messing with sasquatch uh, jack links uh bigfoot you're talking about um and 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 for the uninitiated what's the big thicket country what what region of texas is that in da big the big thicket territory is the area of texas that butts right up against the louisiana swamps uh, a lot of swamp country a, a lot of thick thick woods um when people, most people think of Texas, they think all those cowboy movies like the Alamo and stuff like that. And they think of the areas like around Amarillo, Texas, the area around Dallas, where it's just all prairie and, and you know, prairie, where it's all prairie and scrub grass. East Texas ain't like that. East Texas is thick with foliage. Um, a lot of heavy hill country. You get into the areas on, near uh, Beaumont, Texas, and it's just woods as yeah. far as you can see. Yeah. Uh, just a beautiful... Yeah. Beautiful country. Yeah, you got the Longmont uh, or uh, uh, Beaumont, Longview, Tyler, Athens, out in East Texas area, going towards uh, Louisiana border. It's it's uh, very very similar to the area I grew up in in Mississippi. So very yeah, it's heavily, much it's much more swampy, heavily forested, heavily heavy swamps. Yeah, for sure. It gets a lot of alligators in the in the swamp. In fact, there was a picture floating around uh, that had been taken by a by a drone in Beaumont of an alligator that was like, I want to say 13 or 14 feet long when they captured it, swimming across a small marshy area with an entire deer in its mouth. You could just Holy see the rear crap. haunch and the head sticking out of the mouth. Holy crap. Yeah. Lurch lot had a good, had, had a good uh, geographical kind of a uh, uh, point there. Interstate 35 East. So I 35 runs right through Dallas. For those of y'all don't know, mm -hmm. I 35 runs through Dallas. So, East of there is a big thicket country, and it's pu it's beautiful country. I've been down through that area, uh, I'm not as extensively as I would like, but I have been through that area several numerous times, and it it is just an absolutely beautiful area. Uh, but you you get off the beaten path, and uh, you, yeah, I can easily see how you could take a wrong turn and wind up a statistic. Yeah, well, there's no there's and the thing is too, there's no shortage of food sources there either. So right. I know plenty, plenty of wildlife there, plenty of game for those uh, for those uh, critters to uh, to uh, to snack on. When they well, you've got them. all the usual indigenous creatures. Plus, you you get down in Texas, and the feral pig population is out of control. Huge, huge, huge. I mean, uh, we those things those things could survive on 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 what feral pig alone. Dude, there was there were four of us hunting. Last time I was down there, there were four of us hunting that night after my class, and we dumped uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty-two pigs. Hey, and that, I mean, make a dent in it. That, <laughs> that 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 just that's like you know spitting on a forest fire. You know what I mean? Right. So I mean, they have plenty of food sources down there. Yep. Yeah, that, and and the the uh, if you look at it on a satellite map, like go Google Earth and use the satellite view instead of just the drawn map view. Just look how dense that foliage is. I mean, you could go from basically, you could go from Beaumont to the Mississippi border and probably only leave the swamp to cross asphalt. Yeah. 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 The only thing you're going to, the only, the only pay, the only uh, thing you're going to see going through that road, that swamp is paved roads. That's it. Not a lot of houses out there because it's very hard to, to live in the, in the swamp. Now you got a lot of those, not a lot of Cajuns that live in, in floating house, those old houseboats that they've made. And I've seen some on like swamp people where they'll make them out of you know, a whole slew of 55 gallon drums, drums welded together, which is, I gotta admit is freaking ingenious. Uh, yeah. And, and when you live in it, when you live in an area like the Atchafalaya basin where there's really not a tidal surge, you could do that. I mean, you could live on a house like that. And then you've got the others that have houses that are built up on stilts, things like that. Uh, yeah. So there are folks that do live in those deep swamps, uh, but it ain't a lot. And it's, it's a, it's not an easy lifestyle. Yeah. And David by has a good point too. He said, most of the roads are elevated too. hundred yeah. percent. So yeah. they could they could just go under the bridge. You probably never even know it was down there. Yeah, yeah I mean, you go through the Chafalaya Basin down there, and you going out on one of the 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 the, the roads, the interstate, uh, and it is nothing. There's nothing but swamp and woods 
for miles and miles and miles underneath that 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 bridge. I mean, essentially, the whole the whole interstate is a bridge. You well, the the, uh, the the one that caught, I can't remember the name of the lake right there by Lake Pontchartrain. Uh, the the bridge that cro crosses Pontchartrain into New Orleans. There is a point on that bridge when you lose sight of land. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. It's like you know, people freak out. It's not uncommon for them to have to send an emergency vehicle out there yeah. to coax somebody yeah. off the bridge because you get to a point where you don't see land in either direction. Yeah. When I, every time and, I'm flying in New Orleans going into Mississippi to see my family, uh, yeah, I cross across that bridge and yeah. There's, people don't realize how big Lake Pontchartrain is. It's so a big been, lake. It is massive. My uncle lived uh, off a little uh, little channel, and you and it went out into Lake Pontchartrain, and you could see that bridge. I mean, it was way off in the distance, but you could see it. That I mean, it's like looking out into the ocean. In search, I mean, because it's just you look out, and that's all you see is water. Yeah, Richard Cox says twenty three miles long. That's a big lake. That that's 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 a lot, and and so think of all the stuff that we see, but think of the stuff we don't see, you know. And that's where that's where these suckers come into play because they've got unfettered access to uh, all the all the byways out there. They know, and like we were talking about uh, a while uh, a couple of shows back about how they use these these uh, waterways to navigate and mm -hmm. to feed. And uh, everything else. So that's a that's a solid point. Yeah, you you can't look at a place like that and and you know and and it's easy for people that that haven't really spent a lot of time in the country. And I'm and I'm I'm not knocking city folks. I mean, I'm a farm kid, but and I'm not knocking people that have you know spent their lives in cities. Uh, that's just that's just where they were born and raised. That's what they're used to. But people who have grown up in in large urban areas in 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 city areas that have not really spent much time out in the country. It's easy for them, you know, people there for people like that to set back and say, "Oh, there's no way something like this could, something like Bigfoot could exist because we'd have found it by now." Until you've been out into the wild parts of this country and realize just how much wilderness is still out there. Yep, hundred percent. Yeah, little, <laughs> little Patty, Patty says, "I've been on that causeway. You don't see land in any direction. Scared the crap out of me." Yeah, yeah, it's true. It, yeah, yeah. I mean, how, you, how many acres did you say, DA, of national uh, forests? Over a million in the United States. Yeah, or it, oh, just national parks. Uh, I I don't know how many acreage total in national parks, but in, in in the Mark Twain National Forest and the Ozarks National Forest, which are two major national forests right here in the Ozarks, uh, just those two alone between the two of them is about four and a half to five million acres of protected forest land. And that's just those two. That's a lot. A lot. Yeah, it is a lot, a lot, a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. That's just Missouri and Arkansas. That is not How? counting some of the other, other uh, any of the other states. That is just two forests in those two states. And there, that there are other sections of national forest, national parkways in both states, but I'm just talking the Mark Twain and the Ozark. Between the two of them, between four and five million. Un a lot of it, a lot of it's areas that people may never have even been because mm -hmm. they've never, you know, they're not allowed to log it. Uh, you know, the, if, if if humans have been in some of these mountain these valleys down there, it's been going through it. There aren't homesteads in it. There there are barely roads through it. If you drive through the, the Mark Twain, it's a road, I suppose you could call it, but it's one of those where you better hope you don't have a flat because there ain't no shoulder and <laughs> ain't no place to pull off. If you've got to change a flat in the Mark Twain, it, it is it is some spooky, sneaky, sneaky, snaky territory, and I would uh, I would not wish it off on somebody lightly, especially at night. B has a good a good one uh, observation. There are many folks saying that they have seen Bigfoot in Philadelphia and Detroit, where there are many abandoned homes. Well, that that doesn't surprise me. Now, uh, much like we were saying on the last show, when me and my my buddy Chris found that house abandoned out in the middle of the woods, we found a nest in it. I think that they are not above using old abandoned dwellings, and it doesn't surprise me that they're finding them in cities because there have been sightings of Dogman and Bigfoot in the greater Los Angeles area. Uh, yeah. the, the, it, it, there are towns in Oklahoma that tell people to keep their keep their garbage cans in their in their 
in their garage until time for trash pickup because these things would come in into town. Yeah. Uh, it is not unheard of. And even here in Springfield, and this is just an example of wild animals that we know exist. Springfield is the third largest city in the state of Missouri. And I've, I've said this before, but I've, I've noticed a lot of names that haven't been been around before. So I'll, I'll repeat myself. Um, Springfield's the third largest metropolitan area, area in the city, in the state of Missouri. Uh, it's behind Kansas City and St. Louis. If you count the little bedroom communities, and there's about a dozen of them that butt right up against the city limits of Springfield, all told of probably a quarter of a million people. And I know it's not Chicago or anything like that, you know, it, it, but for our area, it's a lot of folk. Um, inside of the city limits of Springfield, people with the ring doorbell cameras are picking up mountain lions and black bears. I think, you know, with the, uh, the the Black Plague of the 21st century keeping people home for so long, nature started taking some areas back. And to a large extent, I think a lot of these things, including Bigfoot, are losing their fear of us. I completely agree with that. Yeah, I do, too. Uh, I'm sorry, guys. The old man's got to go out again. He's uh, almost 11-year-old shepherd, so his kidneys ain't good. Don't worry, brother. I'll be right Don't worry, brother. Yeah. We got you. So, what do you, what do you think about that, about Robbie? I mean, I mean, uh, we we've, we've said that many times. That, and I think I think this just, you know, you've seen, y'all know me. I, I love watching documentaries. I've watched all those about what would happen and how long it would take nature to take, like, if any big city just at any point ha was totally abandoned. It would not take nature any time to take stuff like that back over. Well, look what so Doyle Thorne just posted. The national park system has 424 areas totaling 85 million acres that, of protected forest land. So, if there's 85 million acres of protected forest land. And that's probably not counting like... Uh, state that's national parks. Yeah, that's national. That's not that's state not parks. State. And that's not you know. So let's but let's just take the, the eighty five million. If there's that much, and let's say that's where they where they kept to when people were all out and were there, and all of a sudden something causes people to not be there anymore. Right. It and plague of the twenty first century kept us out out for about what two years. Thereabouts, thereabouts. Yeah, yeah. in some places so, a little longer. I mean, so, uh, some some of those some of the, those uh, regulations are still in place in some of the bigger yeah. cities. So it's not anywhere close to impossible to think that because you know we've seen it with bears and cougars and other animals that there's more sightings of all those now. So. Mm -hmm. It, it, to me, it's just, it's a no brainer to think that people are not there. Animals are going to come back in. They're going to, they're going to push back into what, to other territories. I mean, if you've got a healthy population and there, and things are, you know, there's, they're, the breeding is going like it's supposed to, they're going to need more area. And if there's no humans there to keep them out of that area, they're going to start moving out. I mean, it's just, I, I, you know, it, it's a no brainer for me that well, that's, that's one of the biggest reasons that these sightings are, are starting to climb. Well, when you, when you look at the animal world, you know, there's, there's two types of animals. There's predator and prey, just plain and simple. You know, that, you know, some people might want to argue that that be, as being an oversimplification, oversimplif but when it boils down to it at the end of the day, there are predators and there's prey. Now, anytime a big predator moves out of an area, the prey items start responding quickly. They, they, they mm -hmm. repopulate, they'll go back into that area. And what does that do? It generally atta attracts another big predator because suddenly the meals are easy. Yep. Uh, right. now when, humans, when humans started staying out of these areas, a lot of the stuff that, that humans normally hunt, like deer and, you know, turkey and, and even squirrels to an extent. I mean, you know, squirrel is a staple of, of Missouri hillbilly diet. Uh, so, you know, there, you know, there's lots of things that, that, that were no longer being hunted that are replenishing it, you know, and they do it at a very, very quick rate, believe me. Well, uh, so, but when these recover, more, more predators will be drawn into the area. Probably just, look ahead, sorry. What, just look at what happens uh, on these offshore 
oil rigs, when they put one of those in, and it becomes a natural uh, reef. Yeah. Fish automatically school to that. And all of a sudden, you have this explosion of population of bait fish, basically. What does that bring in? Sharks. Bigger fish to eat them. Yep. Yeah. And so if you can see that in the in the world that we study, in the natural world that we can study, you know, you got to use that as a as your basis for what if it happens there, why isn't why why is it so hard for people to believe that it's happening these other places? And you know, people are starting to see these creatures more and there's more sightings and I think people are starting to there's more people starting to think, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna worry about what people think about me. I'm just gonna I'm gonna say what I I'm gonna say what I saw. Mm-hmm. So and the more people that actually start coming forward, that's just going to in turn bring more people to the, you know, to the fight, so to speak. And I, I, I think that's where we're at right now is you're starting to that boiling point. Right. For lack of a better term. Uh, Mr. Mr. Duffy says the juveniles are in the suburban areas, but they eat mostly water, waterfowl and raccoons, small ant mammals and rodents, including domestic animals. That's what I find in Colorado. It, you know, that wouldn't surprise me if you're finding Bigfoot that are coming into more urban areas. It's going to be the younger ones that are more curious because the bigger ones remember those lessons like, hey, the short yeah. the short hairless guys got guns and the younger ones are like, nah, it will be fine. <laughs> uh, yep. Mr. Duffy, 81. Where in Colorado are you located? Because I'm I'm east of Colorado Springs. I just be I'm curious to know where you are, sir. But um, and we lost him. He gone. He gone. No, I'm still I'm still here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I just turned my camera off for a second. He incognito. Yeah. I didn't figure our, our viewing population wanted to watch me scratching my back with a back scratcher. That's hot. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might be digging in your nose. I didn't know. No, no. Very interesting. <laughs> I mean, like it, like a little know, wooden back scratcher. Yeah, he brings up Mr. Duffy eighty one brings up a good point too because like uh you know in Boulder, uh, I mean. Bears, big cats, everything like that, just like you're talking about, DA. They're like, hey, keep your little little critters, your little fee-fee dogs and whatever, uh, and cats, keep them in at nighttime and, and keep your trash cans in your in your garage because the bears and the cats come down. That's a food source. Just like you've yeah. even said it in Missouri, they they've captured them on camera in dumpsters behind restaurants, have they not? Oh yeah, absolutely. It is not uncommon at all. There, In fact, just, uh, down at Kimberling City, Missouri, where I set the Lakeview Man, uh, it was just maybe three four months ago that the, I think there was something in the local news about a restaurant worker who went outside to smoke, and there was a black bear, you know, with its ass in the air eating food out of the dumpster, and he was filming it with his cell phone while he smoked. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. Here's says... Miss Lene says, on our farm, if we don't keep a good pack of three or more farm dogs, the coyotes and every other predator, big predator yeah. come back in no time. Yeah. Now, what were you going to say there, Rip? Here's something interesting to think about. <laughs> Take him to the train station. Now, um, That's right. Big, big predators, big animals don't get that way because they're stupid. Right. They, right. they generally stay a what you know trophy animal let's just call it because you know people look at the big those are the trophy animals not that we're talking about hunting them or anything so let's just let's just consider maybe a lot of the one even the the bigger ones that, that people see these eight or nine footers maybe mm -hmm. those still are juveniles maybe That's some a of these terrifying are, thought but it had an eight feet tall it's still a juvenile but well think about it you yeah. know some of these, some of these really, really, really remote areas that nobody has ever really been into, mm -hmm. what could really be there? If these, yeah, well, you know, that, some of the, some the Bigfoot, re, big, Bigfoot reports led uh, Ron Moorhead. He took a uh, took a took an account, and they they uh, they made a casting 
of a 24 inch track but then i believe you said it was a six and a half or seven foot stride they estimated the height at the thing at just under 20 feet but that's what i'm saying using using that uh that baseline of judgment of the younger ones are or the more curious ones those are the ones that are going to venture out what if all these that we're that are being sighted and we're seeing are the younger ones that are just curious and are venturing out and we ain't even seen the big ones it's entirely I mean, possible. I, that's terrifying to think about and it's but i mean holy you see it. Batman. it would give credence to the mountain giant stories yeah it would holy crap that's 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 actually kind of horrifying to think about that, man. But I mean, yeah. they're 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 opportunistic, and and honestly, and you think of you bring a good point up too, Robbie. The younger ones are going to be, you know, not to say less jaded, but they're going to be less cautious than mm -hmm. the uh, than the adults will, because the adults are like, yeah, I ain't going down there because last time I went down there, you know, Ray Ray got shot. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and so uh, we're we're not going back down there. Jimmy G says, so that 85 million acres was interesting. That's almost the almost the landmass of Australia. And that's national parks here in the US. Like we said, that only just, that's not even just state. national parks, not state parks, just national parks and, and restricted forests. 85 million acres. Robbie, I got two words for you. 458 SOCOM. <laughs> I got one word for you. Howitzer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gunship. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Duffy sure. says, I went into an area where there was a missing beagle sign. I found the head of the dog with all the skin peeled off of it, connected at the nose. Well, that ain't normal. That's not that, yeah, that's never that's not something yeah. a bear would do. And he lives that, he lives west of Denver. So I am about an hour south of him, southeast of him. So, yeah. What does that comment remind you of? Can't ask Doc because he ain't seen it. Think about the the guy that was talking about in uh, Legend of Boggy Creek, where he was talking about his prize dog. That's exactly mm -hmm. what he described happened to his dog. Yeah. Peeled the hide off his dog. Right. Now I, I saw it. I saw Boggy Creek finally. Finally, well, about time. I He's know. in uh, the club finally. Yeah. Steve Patton says, "Talk about a brown pants moment." walking around the house and coming face to face with a skunk. That's where the one of those moments where I agree not to spray it with my pepper spray and it agrees not to spray me. And we'll just, we'll just go our separate ways. Nope. Nobody needs handcuffs involved in this particular incident. Let's just walk away peacefully and call it a, call it an impasse. Call it a day. You go your way and I'll go mine. Peace as the, as the song by, uh, uh, was it B buddy Holly? You go your way and I'll go mine now and forever till the end of time. Yep. Uh, Captain Yornot says, we had baby bears in the dumpster behind the ice cream shop in Montana. Young Bigfoot eat the same thing, really. Doesn't yeah, surprise me. That's true. Uh, Mr. Duffy says, the skin was peeled from the neck all the way off the head but connected at the nose. So it basically just peeled it off the skull like a mask and left it connected at the tip of the nose. That's, that's not something that's, you run into very often. Golly. That's pretty much how that guy in, in Legend of Boggy Creek described it. John Wayne Gate says, as an elk hunter in Washington State, you will never forget the vibration when one of those big boys growls at you. Well, that's that's like you were talking about. Uh, Y'all both talked about this. That infrasound that mm -hmm. that will that will vibrate you internally. You know. Miss Lene is talking about her farm uh, being bordered by a national forest. Uh, my uncle's land, where I had my my encounters when I was deer hunting, uh, that it wasn't it wasn't uh, national forest land. It was conservation land. It was protected by the Missouri Department of Conservation. You couldn't hunt it. And my uncle's land was right. Actually, it was mostly surrounded by it. Uh, only one side of his property didn't face conservation land. Hmm. That's a big backyard right there, son. And that's why when I was out in a deer stand, I knew dang good and well there wasn't nobody should have been coming in on me because yeah. the only way they could have come in on me was through conservation land, and that would have been quite the hike. Well, uh, Avi May says, 30 years in Washington, four Bigfoot and one Predator-esque sighting. North Dakota, North Dakota now and UFOs are more prevalent. Well, like you said, DA, they don't know, they don't know the territorial markers like we do. 
True. Jimmy G says that eighty-five million is wrong. Australia is one point five billion. I was looking at my my landmass actually inhabited. Australia is almost empty. Yeah, I, I thought that might seem a little little small for Australia, but I wasn't going to argue. Um, John, Josh Dalton says, "Doc, you mean young and dumb as crap." <laughs> yeah, yeah. The juveniles probably are. They're more. They're like I said. They're more liable liable to take chances than an older one that's more seasoned. You know, yep. that's what we are. We're not old. We're just seasoned. Seasoned. Uh, Steve Payton says, I see a mountain giant. No, no, going to say gonna how fast my short, chunky butt can run. I'm with you, Steve. I'm with you. Uh, D, D says, I think more are looking finally now in the science world with better technology. We have be we have every year and training, really. It's just a matter of time now. We'll all have proof for the non-believers. You know, again, and I, I, I agree with that, but there's only going to be so long that the government can keep a lid on this. Right. Eventually it's going to get out. Uh, I, like I've said with my Teddy Roosevelt theory, I, uh, I firmly believe that the, the U S government has known about these things for a very long time. And I kind of, that's kind of the, the, the theory I'm going off of for my, my dark, my dark frontiers novels. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, that's going to incorporate my Teddy Roosevelt theory well, at some I mean point. Let, let's look at let's look at the de declassification of the UFO stuff over the last couple mm -hmm. of years. Yeah, you know? I mean, there's there's overwhelming evidence, you know, from multiple multiple sources outside the the military and government that are saying this. So the more like he, they, he brings up a good point, or he or she brings up a good point. I mean, it's it's just a matter of time now before they have to say they have to admit their existence. Uh, Billy Mitchum says, Mim K. Davis shows a picture on that farm, and one is taller than a 10 foot fence with a barbed wire on top. So we're talking 13 feet tall. Yeah, there's been footage of very, very big, big, especially eye shine. Sometimes, well, in that video we recorded down at Joe Bald, uh, there's numerous spots in, uh, where there's eye shine. And I just, when I first saw that, when I first realized there was eye shine in the video, I was like, eh, we get eye shine in Missouri all the time. You can't go out in the woods without getting eye shine somewhere. Uh, but looking back at some of it, it was in, in places where there weren't branches, and some of it was pretty high off the ground. Uh, John Cunningham says, Canada just had NORAD shoot down a UFO in the Yukon about two hours ago. Yep. Ooh, that's freaking cool. I'd like to hear more about that as it that's, develops. Uh, that's three in the last seven days. They shot one down uh, over Alaska, and then they just shot one down over the Yukon. It was a Air Force F-22. So do you, do you really think... They're actually shooting down UFOs, or it could be more of these balloons. I, I don't know, but the the pilots. Uh, I saw this earlier on a news feed. One of the pilots that shot down the one uh, in Alaska said that it was the size of a small car, had no visible propulsion system uh, to keep it up, and it was interfering with their sensors. And oh. if you're interfering with the F twenty two sensors, that's advanced. That's that's saying something right there. So that was that was that was pretty that was pretty interesting for me to say that they were it was interfering with the sensors. I'm not trying to get off topic, but it was just oh no no yeah no, it, was, no. it was it was extremely interesting to me to say hey if if you're interfering with one of the most advanced fighter aircraft that we have, you know then that's that's saying something right there. Like you like Robbie said, that's pretty advanced. Uh, James Fadeke says, anyone ever heard or heard of light blue eye shine before? You know, that rings a bell with me, and I can't for the life of me think of what the story was. But I, I, I do remember I do remember reading something about a, a, something with, with light blue eye shine. Um, I think, it, Robbie, I think it was in your neck of the woods. I think it was a sheep squatch story about it having light blue eye shine. I've, I mean, I've heard some of the sheep squat stories, but I, I can't remember if I've. Heard I, I would have to, about that. I'd have to go back and check some of my old notes because that does it, it strikes a chord with me somewhere. I've heard of light blue eye shine somewhere. <laughs> World War fifty six seventy horses are old warriors and bold warriors, but there are no old bold warriors. Little little Patty said, "We always get off topic." Sorry, little yeah. Patty. It, it, it's 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 bound to happen. My bad. 
me and Doc never contribute to that. I don't know what y'all talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Hey, I'm going to say this real quick. We got 203 people looking at us right now, and we appreciate y'all. And we, but we got 11 likes and loves. So how about giving us a little more love? So hit that like and subscribe button, and give us a little more thumbs up. On, on the YouTube channel, we got 136. So we appreciate y'all for hanging out with us. Definitely. Um, but you know, more, I'm kind of jumping back toward where that applies toward Bigfoot. Oh, got a new subscriber, uh, Dina Dina Kingery. Awesome, thank you. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to uh, D, the the DAX Machination. Um, we kind of jumping back into into Bigfoot, you know, Bigfoot there, and this applies not only to the to the to the skunk ape, but to Bigfoot in general. Is you know what we were saying about you know, 85 million acres, that 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 to me is you know bigger than some countries. Yeah. Uh, I mean you know, and, and the people that that are naysayers that say there's no habitat for these creatures clearly aren't really paying attention, or they live someplace where they just have no idea how much forest is really out there. I mean, anybody can go on Google Maps, go on Google Maps and look at North America and switch to the satellite view and just and look at how just how much unbroken green there is in this country. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, and how much of that is uh, unexplored territory, you know, that yeah. we may have never step, set foot on, you know, it's kind of mind boggling when you think about it and in, in that perspective. And I, I think, um, I know we're encroaching more into, into territory, um, but, but you know, there's always going to be those protected areas in the national parks, and even in state parks. Um, Bennett Springs State Park here, here in Missouri, and it's a state park. It's not a national park. It's got a good chunk of, of land with it too. Uh, but there are a number of Bigfoot sightings around Bennett Springs, including a, a young couple who was uh, near the near the uh, the boundary of the park, uh, enjoying a, a, an adult moment in their pickup. Uh, when they got ran off. Not by started, police, I'm assuming. It, no, it wasn't the police shining a spotlight. Something started screaming at them, and I guess the boyfriend got out to see what it was, and he walked around to the back of the truck, and uh, it wasn't about 20 seconds before he was diving back in the truck and firing it up, and she looked out the window and was screaming, go, 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 go. Uh, so this thing come out of the woods behind him, and, and I guess it was a uh, you know, coitus interruptus, so to speak. That's, that's a buzz kill. Just Sasquatch just, is interrupted. Just say it like that. Just ruined the moment. I don't. I just. I can't. Yeah. I can. I can see how that would kill the kill the mood for love. <laughs> oh mercy, that's funny. But you know that was one of the best ones from right there at Bennett Springs, and it was literally right on the edge of the park. And uh, that place I've talked about many times, Moon Valley, is only a few miles from that spot. I could take you right to that spot. I know right where that happened. Wow. That's scary. Yeah, I mean, it, there's clearly more than enough territory to support, you know, a large population. 100%. Absolutely, man. I mean, I mean it, it'd be naive to think otherwise, man, with all the, with all the territory that's out there that, maybe never has even had our feet stepped on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that, that's a, that's a lot of land. A lot of land. Uh, Karen Golden was saying, what do you think of the photo of the one behind the palm frond? How big do you think that one was? Uh, that one's kind of hard to gauge uh, because you can only roughly guess based on the size of the palm fronds. And there's some variance in the size of those, depending on how old the plant was. So that one's really hard to call how big it is, but I would guess it's at least seven feet. Well, uh, remember the picture William sent us? Mm-hmm. The I think uh, to quote Doc on that one, that's a big youngin. That's a big youngin. Let's see if I still got that one in here. I think this is. Is this it? Is it coming up? No, it's not that ain't it. The one uh, where it's standing next to the tree. That's not it. Uh, I don't know that I've got that one still on here. Hmm. 
Apparently, I took that one off for whatever reason. Yeah, I don't see it on here anymore. Sorry, Bellers. Yeah, it happens. I'd have to go. Oh, no, I, I did it, on, it is on here. Yes, that one. Holy. <laughs> Holy that's shnikes. Like, that's like yeah. King Kong, man. Yeah. Does Now, now does my theory make a little bit more sense, Doc? It, it, yeah. I remember yep. seeing that picture when we put it up on one of the other shows, and I was like, whew. Now, I'm not knowing the the height of yeah. those trees in the foreground in front of it. Those could be, you know, those could be younger trees. Uh, but I would say at the least, considering the amount of foliage, at the least those trees would probably be in the six to eight foot range, which would put that thing easily 10 to 12. That's a big one. That's a big boy. Holy crap, dude. That's massive. Good Lord. It's T Pad says if it's over five eight, it's taller than Doc. <laughs> I'm only five six, man. T Pad says, I'm nope, nope, nope. <laughs> hey, but I'm like my uncle. My uncle Coy said this. He said, I might only be five six, but I cover every inch of ground I stand on. <laughs> yeah, Kathy Arnott has a, a a good point. Look how long its arms are. Kirst says, oh, something that big? Yeah, I'm going to say 50 PMG for the sidearm going forward. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to don't say, know what, what for the primary, but something bigger. Yeah, I'm going to say a crew serve weapon uh, primarily in like a 50. 20 millimeter recoilless rifle. Uh, Dina Klinger says, aren't too many places for him to hide. Maybe. If the the clear hair follicle theory, well, it, we're seeing a lot of it, a lot of samples collected to prove it. If the clear hair follicle thing is is true and it holds true across the species, it could be just a matter of that thing getting down on all fours and not moving. Yeah, you might walk within ten yards and never see it. I think we lost Doc. I think Doc froze up. Yep. David Bice is getting a truck. There he is. He back. Yeah, you locked up on us there, Doc. My satellite changed over. I was watching my feed. Oh. I was watching my I was watching my Starlink feed, and my satellite changed over. So sorry Damn about satellite. that. It wasn't that other satellite that shall not be named. It was. <laughs> it was the other. May, I mean, hell, we might have a UFO over Colorado right now. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, anything goes at this point. Yeah, they could be jamming our signals. Who knows? Yeah, David by little bitty feller. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, Richard, Richard, um, no, Marlon R. Cox II says, any skunk, aid, uh, skunk ape sighting in South Carolina? Robbie, that's your, your neck of the woods. Uh, well, I, not that it's been officially named the skunk ape, but, um, or officially called saying that this is a skunk ape, but a lot of the sightings do say that or cite that same smell so mm -hmm. you know I, I that's why is it called a skunk ape because it's a different species or it's just that I know skunk ape seems to be primarily used you know when they when people think of florida but i think any swamp swamp dwelling sasquatch type creature could be labeled yeah. a skunk ape. and there's a lot of swamps in south carolina so you know, and swamps typically don't smell good. No, it's, that's true. They, 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 smell not, like they smell like decay, man. They really yeah, do. Exactly. Well, I mean, that that's that's generally what happens in a swamp. I mean, because a swamp is when, you know, that body of water comes into a forest and underneath that water is a lot of rotten trees vegetation. and vegetation. Well, I mean, so, like swamp gas, where all the swamp gas yeah. stuff, the fairy lights and everything like that come from, you know, it came yeah. from decaying organic matter. So, right. Yeah. Well, you know, and we're talking about, you know, a creature that big hiding, uh, it goes right back to the South Carolina swamp thing. Uh, that How how little amount of water was hiding, what did you say, it was a 10-foot gator? 10-foot, about 500 and something pounds in <sighs> two feet of water. 
So if something that big can hide in two feet of water, really how, how big of a stretch of the imagination is to think thick foliage and those clear hair shafts could hide something the size of a Sasquatch, even a really big one. Yep, and and like I said, just let uh, twenty miles Doc, away. Doc is I'm apparently here. thinking about the big ones. <laughs> yes, twenty miles away from me, where me and Norm and Johnny have been uh, doing that. We had that, that same smell. So, mm -hmm. and that that's up in well, that and that's that's a national forest too. Man, Joe Cass, or Joe Cassie Gorge is what that. Uh, runs into so we ain't got no crocodiles or alligators out here that's all i gotta say they gotta wear an oxygen mask if they are <laughs> too far and, and coats yeah <laughs> uh mr duffy 81 says that thing looks like it's 15 feet tall if it's a real picture again yeah. i don't know the provenance of that picture uh william nighthawk sent me that picture so you know i, I trust william so i take I, i'll take william at his word if he says it's a legit picture, I believe it's a legit picture. Uh, I, or again, I don't, but I don't know the provenance. I don't know where it was taken. Uh, William just sent it, sent it to me to show on the show. Uh, so I don't really have a whole lot of information to give you about it. Uh, but just looking at that thing, and I'll bring it right back up here. Yeah, just looking at that thing, that it, the level of detail looks consistent. And uh, generally, when you've got Photoshop, you've got artifact inconsistencies between two items. That and here's something else. Look, look at the shoulders. It looks like it's slumped forward, like it's almost slouching. I don't think that thing's standing completely, completely upright. Whew. What do well, you? He think is that? a big rascal. Does that does that doc does that not look to you like it's kind of slumped forward a little bit? Look at the bend in the in the arms and the way the. Yeah. the because look at his head. The head, uh, the conical, very conical. Shape, the conical yep. shape of the head is kind of listing off to the to the uh, to the starboard side, and like it's looking at you. Yeah. So I don't think that thing's standing completely upright. You could it be could right. Be, it could be a couple of feet taller than what what we see right there. Yeah, yeah I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Twenty yeah. millimeter recoil is rifle. I'm a shooter. Like, I'm deuces. A shooter. I'm out. Yeah. I'm going to shoot him in a ding-ding, and then I'm going to run <laughs> as fast as I can. Well, if it's that big, you really, is it going to think it's anything more than a skeeter bite? Yeah, I, I mean, my little, I mean, I'm built like a friggin' corgi, so I'm going to be, I'm going to be moving as fast as my little short leg can take me. Holy crap. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Tracy big. Hull says, uh, uh, William said it was taken in Alaska. Ooh. Then if it's in Alaska, then not only is it is it big. The pay, that picture was originally sent to Fred Roll. If it if it not only is it big, it's aggressive too, based on the nature of the ones we've heard of from Alaska. Right, the Alaskan ones are are, are take no crap from anybody kind of creatures. Well, if you're that big, you don't have to. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I'm the biggest, meanest son of a gun in the valley. Yep, lurch a lot hit on the head, airstrike. airstrike. Yeah, danger close. Preach, I'm right there with you, son. We have a broken arrow. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy G says it's an interesting parallel between the North American Bigfoots and the Scandinavian trolls. I think they're one and the same, to be honest. I, I think that what they referred to a troll in, as trolls in Scandinavian mythology, uh, I think were Bigfoot-type creatures. Uh, if you look at um, uh, Beowulf, Grendel is described very much like a Bigfoot. Um, so I, I think what they what they were seeing, what they were calling trolls in the, in in Scandinavian countries, probably were Bigfoot uh, Bigfoot creatures, and those could have easily gotten here. If they're, you know, if there's as 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 uh, prone to surviving in in harsh conditions as we believe they are, by just going across the frozen Arctic, and and something going to Beowulf, just going back to that, Grendel was basically a juvenile. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Look at so, you with your literary references there, Robbie. I didn't know you could read. <laughs> you got the graphic novel. Short I can color. 
pictures. <laughs> Wait, Anthony's not here. It's not written in Crayola. There no. we go. Oh, the letter four, the number H, the color green. <laughs> Jake Light says, I'm calling danger close air support, AC-130. But, yeah, I mean, just sitting here, you know, after saying that and just this. <laughs> I can't play it around. Heavy ordinance. Uh, just, God yeah. Family Country 101 said, what's the earliest sighting in the United States and by who? Uh, it depends on what sources you want to cite. Uh, Native American sightings have gone back, you know, thousands of years before Europeans ever set foot on this continent. Uh, some of the most uh, earliest recorded ones that we know of by by uh, settlers. Um, we'll use that term instead of, uh, of worse. But um Set by settlers, uh, some of those date back to the 1600s. Uh, of course, we've got you know the, the account recorded by uh, Teddy Roosevelt in his book, The Wilderness Hunter. There's lots of of these old stories that date back more than a hundred, more than a hundred to even 200 years. General Dalton has a good question for you, DA. What about the Great Dismal Swamp area on the Virginia North Carolina state line for swamp bait? Again, perfect habitat. That's a great, uh, yeah. Ace Banner says, uh, says, could Grindel be a Gugway? Oh, yeah, easily. You know, from the description in, in Beowulf, it, I, I, you know, the way it was, they were taking heads and, and you know, eating people. Yeah, I would say very much it could be, it could have been a Gugway. What does that say it about would Beowulf? Make a lot of he was strong enough to rip its arms off, though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> John Wade Gates says, time to call Gray Eagle. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Duffy says, I'm not saying it's fake. I'm just saying it looks pretty damn amazing. Yeah, it looks like it was up in Alaska or Canada or something. Yeah, we're, what we're hearing now is that it was, it was you know, kicking up in Alaska, that originally it was posted uh, by Fred Roll from his channel, uh, Subarctic Sasquatch, and apparently he had to take it down because too many people were causing issues over it. But, you know, to me, considering the source it came from, I would give that photo some, cre some credence. Um Kathy Arnott says, Roanoke traded with big hairy things. That's true. Uh, in John Smith's diary, he talked about uh, them exchanging uh, trade with a, a tribe called the Susquehannock or something like that. The Sus Susquehannock. I think that's what it was when we did the uh, the, lost, the, the lost colony yep. of Roanoke story. Uh, I'd have to find my notes on that again. Uh, but, you know, they traded with a large hairy tribe. Uh, yeah, don't forget Leif Erikson's account. They, well, yeah, when the Vikings talked about fighting the Skraelings, which they described as being huge, hairy men. Um, for the Vikings to refer to somebody huge and hairy, that, that's got to be a big sucker. And it ran the Vikings off. That says something in itself. That, right. Uh, Jimmy G says, well, Bigfoot. No, not lightly. Um, Jimmy G says, well, Bigfoot type creatures are found and reported under different names from the Barmanu in the mountains boring Pakistan and Afghanistan. The sightings during the Korea War, they're everywhere. Yeah, Bigfoot type creatures have been reported on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, but Antarctica, Antar the access to Antarctica is so, so tightly controlled, it's hard to say what's down there. Well, there's, I mean, there's not a whole lot of. With uh, with the exception of the sea life, there's not a whole lot of animal life in Antarctica anyway. Right. With, well, like you said, that right. they've the penguins and sea lions. Yeah, that, yeah, that they've admitted. Uh, Mr. Duffy says I saw the conical head of a juvenile not 20 feet from where I'm standing right now, and it looked exactly like the shape of that head. Uh, again, th these are all just little things that are that, uh, that are. are, are clicking in that, that'll that give credence to that photo uh, we can't say with a hundred percent certainty that any photo is real unfortunately that we're in the age of photoshop so you know saying that you know this is an absolute you know positive piece of proof is next to impossible uh but you know some sometimes you can just give 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 credence considering the source on some things and uh this thing's checking a lot of a lot of check marks with with, with Mr. Duffy and, and, and a few of us. So you know, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm, I'm going to say 
I believe the, the, the authenticity of this photo, but you know, again, we can't say with a hundred percent certainty yeah. the, the, uh, the authenticity of any photo. Yeah. Cause I mean, even Fred said those creatures that they encountered were big, they were massive. You know, so, I mean, if, if that if that was from the Alaska interior, uh, I mean, he like I said, that, that lends credence to his he, he, to his story, too, because he said those things were massive. So that's that's a lot to to to, to put into that. Wouldn't you when you agree with that, Robbie? Absolutely. hundred percent, because just look at all the other uh, animal species in Alaska. I mean, that's. Bears are huge in Alaska. Yeah. Moose moose are bigger in Alaska. I mean, you got to be big to survive in that kind of mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh God Family Country 101 says I did hear of Magellan recording seeing hairy men in South America. Then a follow-up comment says Magellan named the area in South America where we saw hairy men hairy men Patagonia, which means land of the big feet. I'll be doggone. I didn't know what that meant what Patagonia means. B says North Carolina it. Cherokee legends have Bigfoot and the little people, which one wonders if they aren't related to the little people that live in caves like the hairy people. Very well could. Uh, the Cherokee have a number of a number of uh, Bigfoot like uh, type legends. Uh, probably the most prominent would be the Sewell Kalu. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up with the comments. Uh the who to who? What'd you say? The Sewell Kalu. Man, you're like you're like a, a freaking walking reference book. Because I'm constantly reading reference books. Holy well, crap. do one of you want to do research for books and for the show, man? I I I I go down a deep dive. And the first time I ever heard the phrase Sewell Kalu was from my uncle Buddy. Uh, God Family Country says Magellan sighting was in the 1500s. Uh, oddly enough, the Patagonia area is right where in that area where I where I set Codename Wild Hunt Operation Blood Eagle. That whole area is known as Patagonia. Uh, mm -hmm. So who knows? Might be another book in that area at some time in the future. Uh, Jimmy G says the fact that so many cultures with absolutely no contact with each other had all these shared encounters says a lot to the validity of the sightings. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, I mean, what uh, did they have to gain from it? What did they have to gain from it? Right, exactly. You know, it's not notoriety or Instagram fame or e fame back then. It was, hey, this is what we saw. Yeah. yeah. I'm a manuscript influencer. <laughs> Upwards of six people have read my manuscript. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I send scrolls out on pigeons. They go everywhere. <laughs> I call it a tweet. I've got I've got two thousand first tweet. Yeah. Passenger pigeons. Uh, Mr. Duffy eighty one says there's a picture that someone took of in Nova Scotia. He left apples for the creature and then it showed itself. It looks like a troll with a wide big nose and long hair. That makes perfect perfect sense to me. I mean you know, again, you know, I think I very much think that the, the, the Scandinavian trolls were probably just types of Sasquatch. Bitches <laughs> <laughs> do it for the scrolls. Scroll life. Hashtag scroll life. <clears throat> I've got nine. I've got nine pigeons back. Exactly. It's just a scroll with a thumbs up written, <laughs> sketched on it. <laughs> I guess they would be called flock instead of followers. Holy crap, man. They're We're flocking to me. <laughs> we have we have seriously derailed. Yeah, yeah, we have. No, but, but boys, it, we've stayed on topic for most of the two hours. I was about to say, we we're just over two the two hours, hours and mark. four minutes in it, and we're we're finally really derailing. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's 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 a record for us, I think. I I agree. Might be. Um before we start winding things down, maybe we should uh, mention our affiliate affiliate links. Um, the, I think the first one we'll mention tonight is a is a a brand that's near and dear to me that happens to belong to a short a short little a little pocket sized medic in, in the lower quadrant of this corner here. Uh, so, Doc, why don't you uh, give us a little background on the good <laughs> folks over at Dark Angel Medical? Uh, if you haven't heard of Dark Angel Medical, uh, it's a company I started uh, about uh, 12 years ago. 
and uh, we sell trauma kits. Uh, anything from minor first aid to major first aid, i.e. trauma. Uh, and we also teach people how to use the uh, components that they uh, have in their kits and to deal with a lot of emergencies because, like I always tell people, you are your own first responder and hope is a poor strategy. Uh, if you are out and about uh, driving in your vehicle every day, um, going to and from work, to and from your home, anything like that, uh, be prepared for the unexpected uh, because, uh, like I always say, the, the time chooses you. Uh, we have anything from like a, a, you know, the, the tiny little ouch pouch that DAs carried, uh, the EDC kits, the, the uh, dark kits, the St. Mike bags, hard cases, things like that. Um, and to be prepared for any eventuality, uh, you need to be prepared for it, uh, to have the, to have the right equipment for it. And so uh, head over to dark angel medical. Uh, and, uh, if you use the coupon code cryptid two five, that's in the banner right now, cryptid two five, that is 25% off. That's the largest discount we offer. That's our thank you for, uh, subscribing or joining into our channel. And, uh, if you do that and you write in the order notes, Team Odin will include a really cool little Team Odin rocker for you. And, uh, and we will, uh, we'll send that out to you as quick as we can. And if you ever use one of your kits to save yourself or someone else, uh, let us know, shoot us an email uh, and let us know what you've used. And we will replace that 100% free of charge. And that is called our kit for life guarantee. So that's something I'm pretty passionate about. We've got over 160 saves now. Uh, we're up to 163 now. And so that is uh, 163 people walking around with another birthday as a result of an idea that this redneck from South Mississippi had a few years ago because I believe there's a need for it. And I believe that people need to be self-reliant. Because if you're going to be out in the woods, if you're going to go camping, fishing, hunting, backpacking, cryptid hunting, perhaps, basic 911 might not even be available. You might be in some place where you got no cell service. Uh, right. And if you've ever been out in some of these national forests, that is not an understatement. You, Unless you've got a satellite phone, you're probably not calling anybody. And even, even if you had a satellite phone, depending on how far back you are, your first, respond, first responders might be hours away. That's right. And you can, and here's the thing, guys, you can bleed out. You can lose enough blood to lose your life in less than four minutes. And average EMS response time in urban areas in the United States is about seven to eight minutes. And it can be many times longer than that in, in suburban or rural areas. Uh, and, uh, and they may not be coming. So, you, your own first responder. David By said it because I said it in my class out in Kansas that so he came to. I consider ourselves the, the Hank Hill of medical. We sell med kits and med kit accessories. So uh, uh, get a kit because the life you save may very well be your own. Or someone you love. Or someone you love, even more importantly. Exactly. Um, and you know, folks, I carried a Dark Angel kit for years as, a, as an on-duty cop. And I, I can't think of a, any any other kit I would trust my life to. Uh, the kits are just that good, and I know Doc will 100% stand behind those kits, and they are, to, in my in my opinion, the best in the business. I I wouldn't put another kit on my duty belt; just would never have done it. Um, so you know, no matter what you're, uh, no, no matter what you're doing, you know, and, and if you know somebody that if you got somebody that you care about that's a first responder, these make these kits make awesome gifts. They really do. Uh, I can guarantee you as a cop, if somebody would have bought me one of those kits, I would have been beside myself because they are just that good. Uh, fantastic kits. You know, no, I, so again, I appreciate it, brother. And AAO has a question. He said, Doc, if my son works for the Sheriff's Department as an armed DO, do you have a special kit for him? He has to carry turnips, et cetera. We do have a lot of specific kits. Just go to our website, darkangelmedical.com. Uh, look through the table, through the, the list of contents, the product description on the kits. It'll tell you everything you need to know uh, on those. If you have any questions, shoot us a uh, question, shoot any emails to info at darkangelmedical.com and we'll get you squared away. 
And uh, what is it? What is it you always say? Be the difference. Be the difference, man. Get a kit, get trained, and be the difference because absolutely, um, it, it it could very well be your life or your life of your loved ones on the line. Our other affiliate, and uh, this will be should be popping up right any second, is the good folks over at ScallywagTactical.com. Scallywag Tactical makes some of the best knives I have ever owned. And if you're going to be spending any time out in the woods, uh, you know, a, a good edged weapon is your best friend. Uh, you're definitely going to want to carry a good pocket knife, a good sheath knife, uh, because, you know, you know, any, how many survival situations can be greatly improved by the by the presence of a good blade? Uh, you never know when that's going to come in handy. I mean, they're just so versatile a tool. Uh, and carrying a med kit uh, uh, go hand in hand with carrying a good blade uh, because you might need it. Uh, there you go. And that's just a little one. That's just a little feller. Well, I'm but, a little uh, feller, so I need a little that's, knife. That's true. Um, but they've got everything from the big sheath knives all the way down to just, just your, your average small pocket uh, 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 pocket knives. One, uh, one rip there was showing is called the Dew Claw. If you like that knife, you might want to grab it now because they're discontinuing it. Um, Kathy Arnott says a dull knife is dangerous. Well, I can tell you every knife I've gotten from Scallywag was wicked sharp right out of the box. Uh, that one that Doc's got right there is called the Gunner's Mate. Uh, that one features heavily in my writing for a reason. Uh, I, like, I think I like Doc's Gunner's Mate better than mine. Mine's got the two-tone blade. This, uh, this thing is stupid sharp, y'all. Yeah. Oh, God, so, yes. Yeah. Karen, Karen Polson says, Scallywag is coming out with Karambit again around May. They had one for the longest time. But then... Uh, <laughs> and that's, out, that's right out of the box, isn't it, Robbie? Yep. I ain't put a stone on it. That's straight out of the box. Um, yeah, and the, the quality of the steel is just second to none. Uh, some of their pocket knives are, are, are on sale right now as little as like 12 bucks. Yes. And that is hard to, hard to ignore. And we're not talking, I've got a number of cheap pocket knives I bought over the years and I bought this one when I was still a cop and carried it and you can see it's missing the tip and get it back over there. I busted the tip off on it on something. I don't know what I was doing, but it wasn't anything serious, but the tip just snapped right off this thing. Uh, I, have, I, have put, claw. I have put my scallywag knives to the test and I haven't even so much as dulled them. Yeah, they're fantastic blades. And uh, Outlaw Nation, that's called a dew claw. Uh, Mitch A. Bear has a question What kind of steel is it? Different, the different blades have varying different, uh, different right. steel to them. So you have to check their website to see exactly what kind of steel it is. This one's D2. That's tool a tool steel. That's a tool steel. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And if you look at the thickness of it, the whole thing is full, 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 uh, full tang. Look how thick that son of a gun is. Yeah. Stephen Bishop, do any of y'all have their bounty blade? DA does. I, as soon as they get them back in stock, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to be getting one. The bounty has been also featured in DA's books. And that is a limb lopping son of a gun. It's, if you look at the blade profile, it's kind of kukri esque because of the the heavy the heavy point on the end. So that gives you more leverage when you're chopping. You can use this thing with two hands easily. And uh, I don't know if the 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 uh, the uh, microphone pick it up, but I can run my finger off of it, uh, my thumb across it. Just lightly, and it sings like that. Sing, sing, sing. That's kind of rad. Yeah, this thing is wicked. Yeah, almost as cool as med kits. Just almost. Because you don't go hand in hand with a good med kit. If you get if you get a good blade, you better get you a good med kit because you might have to use it. <laughs> you might need it. And uh, at out uh, for Outlaw Nation, if you like that Duclaw, like Da said, you better jump on it now because they're getting ready to discontinue it. Yeah, and they are. I'm gonna tell you, it's it is that is a excellent everyday utility. Do anything you need knife. I keep mine right over here next to my everyday carry pistol, because when that goes on my 
that goes on my belt that goes on my belt with the the pistol and uh the uh edc kit from yep. from uh, dark angel and this sheath that it comes with little kydex sheath it's you can set it up just about any way you want i've got mine set up for a scout carry where i carry it on the, on my belt like i just got to reach back behind me and pull it out so that's on my belt whenever i go out with my with my gun on my right side and i like i said got it set up for that scout carry it's comfortable i can sit in the car sit in a chair and it doesn't bother me at all uh aao says if my husband carries a k-bar and i need to get him a gift do you have something like that that I, i'm not familiar with knives if you're looking for something similar to a k-bar yeah you're gonna want the gunner's mate yeah, that's a bad boy but uh but i don't think he would be disappointed with any of them uh just go to scalawagtactical.com and look at the the assortment of blades they got uh i don't know a, a single guy who's who's you know who works with his hands or or you know who carries a knife who would turn his nose up at about any of these blades because they mm -hmm. are just fantastic um i've got two or three of their pocket knives and i carry one literally everywhere i yep. go yeah they're great knives man great yep knives. too i i like the i like the scout carry and and the and the sales they're having on our knives right now uh i mean they're great gifts for folks oh yeah absolutely i, I sent i sent a couple of knives to my brothers uh and some other friends of mine and everybody has loved them uh because they're like man this is a great knife so uh you won't ever you won't ever miss having a good knife but you'll definitely miss it if you have a crap knife. Oh yeah. Yep. You know, and, and one thing, uh, one thing I always want to point out uh, about both Dark Angel and about Scalawag is they're both veteran-owned companies. And those those of you who know me that uh, know know me well know that you know not only supporting our veterans, but uh, the twenty-two a day program in particular uh, is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I, I believe in supporting our veterans, and I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the 22 a Day Foundation and the Valhalla Project, which helps in helps to end veteran suicide. Uh, we lose 22 veterans a day on average, and I would like to see that number brought down to zero. Amen. Uh, it's it's something that is very near and dear to me, and uh, yeah, it, it just it's a long story. Uh, I'm I'm both a veteran and a cop. Uh, and I've, I've had too many friends buried under a flag and it's, it's, again, it's very near to my, near and dear to my part, heart. So, you know, reach out and support to both Scalawag Tactical and, and, and Dark Angel Medical. They're veteran owned companies. They are, you know, American companies. They're good, strong companies that, that, that deserve our support. And, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if you're wanting anything from t-shirts to, to really badass mugs like this particular one, uh, I got this. It says honor their sacrifice. This is one of my one of my coffee mugs that I use all the time. I got that from the Valhalla Project, uh, and a hundred percent of the proceeds, uh, you know, less overhead. Obviously, they've got to stay in business, but all the profits from the from the Valhalla Project go directly to Baron, veterans charities. Uh, so you can get some really badass T-shirts over there. I've got a couple of really good ones. In fact, that, that same logo that says honor their sacrifice on my coffee mug. I've got that on a T-shirt. Uh, so, you know, check those out and, you know, let's help, let's help, let's, let's make that 22 a day, zero a day. Amen. Um, uh, quick shameless plug before, before we, uh, we call it a night. Uh, if you guys are not familiar with my books, I'd hope you'd check them out. I write a lot of cryptid fiction. I've got some zombie series and sci-fi series as well, working on a fantasy series. Uh, I've got 28 books currently in print and number 29 is getting close. Um, so you know, hope uh, hopefully you guys would check those out if you like cryptid stories with a lot of action. I think it'd be right up your alley. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with my books, uh, the new book that I'm working on is called Dark Frontiers. It's a cryptid a cryptid horror series set in 1865, right at the close of the Civil War. Um, I'm 40,000 words, a little over 40,000, almost 42,000 words into into it, and I hope to have it done in the next couple of weeks. Uh, it's probably going to wind up in the ballpark of a hundred thousand. Um, the um, lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, 
but uh, for those of you who are members of the Patreon community, uh, a sample of that is already up for you to check out. Uh, it's the prologue and the first chapter are up over on the pa at patreon.com slash DA Roberts author. Um, let me put that up as a banner. Uh, so if you would like to, to be a member of the Patreon community, uh, you'll get a chance to see uh, short stories and, and, and covers and, and, uh, and books before they're even out. Um, you'll also you know, be able to have input on what order the books are written in, possible titles. And for some people, you know, they're probably even going to be characters named after them, depending on the tier, the tier you're in. Um, you know, but I've already named quite a few characters after people, and it's a trend I'm going to continue to do. Uh, so if you uh, if you are interested in helping shape the future of the DA verse, uh, check out patreoncom slash DA Roberts author. Um, I'm sure that you'll find something over there you enjoy. There's a lot of short stories and 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 books over there. You well parts uh, parts of books over there that you guys guys can check out and read. Um, Papa Bear says the biggest cause of death is suicide. Yeah, I'm right there with you, man. It is. It is. Uh, Papa Bear says, you know, they just released a report, the Great War on Terror. Veterans are on a pace to be extinct by 2050 with Vietnam veterans about 2055, which means almost no Great War on Terror vets are expected to live to 100. And that's that's horrible. That is absolutely horrifying. Um, folks, if, you, if you've got friend, friends or family, that are that are veterans just every once in a while just random times just do a buddy check uh doc can tell you uh i'm sure robbie can tell you because sometimes i'll just send a random text you know usually it's something like fuck are you okay you know <laughs> shit like that because that's how we talk to each other if you if you if you aren't a vet, if you haven't been a veteran or a cop you don't realize how how we talk to each other and it, most people would be like I can't believe you said that, but it, we find it pretty funny. And uh, I've also sent that almost exact text to Doc, like, hey, F, are you, F, are you awake? And, of course, that usually starts conversations, but uh, that's not uncommon. But, you know, yeah. you've got veteran friends or law enforcement friends or first responder friends. Law enforcement first responders see some pretty horrific crap in their life. I got day. one of those this morning, matter of fact. Yeah. Reach out and check on, on your folks that are first responders in law enforcement or you know, law enforcement and, and veterans. Uh, reach out and check them. Just shoot them a text once in a while, you know, when you're thinking of them, uh, because you never know when that 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 one moment when you pop in and say, "Hey, I was just thinking about you and wanted to check on you," might be all the difference that they needed to know somebody cares. Amen to that. Uh, so check on your buddies, check on your friends, support the 22 a day project, uh, support our veteran-owned businesses, and 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 let them know that we that we love them and care about them. Um, Jake Light says, just remember, embrace the suck. Exactly. Embrace the suck. Because sometimes you just got to. Um, Jimmy G says, if you don't have any vet or first responder friends, find some that are good people. Absolutely correct. I'm right there with you, man. Um, yeah. Do a buddy check once in a while. I'm sure it, 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 it will, I don't think there's ever going to be a guy that doesn't appreciate you being checked on. Um, so, you know, again, folks, you know, you just support the 22 a day project, uh, support your veteran owned businesses, check in with your, your veteran friends and, and your first responder friends and Scallywag Tactical and, and Dark Angel Medical are two, just are two fantastic examples of veteran owned businesses that deserve our love and support. And I, I support both of them wholeheartedly. Craig Burhart, the owner of, uh, of, uh, Scallywag Tactical is just a hell of a good guy, and you know I guess I get along with Doc. Okay, he's 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 a pretty good little feller. I guess I'll keep him around. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> he's a little feller. I can fit him in my luggage carry on. He fits in that. And, 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 yeah, he fits in the overhead compartment, and he works for whiskey. I'm like a carry on baggage with treats. <laughs> uh. God, I love you, Doc. <laughs> you see the overhead compartment open up, and a little hand reaches out, handing you a shot glass. Yeah, no, he just leans down and refills up. your refills your glass and disappears. You, you need a med kit, a refill, or a reload. I'm good for all of it. We got, we got a med kit in one hand, a mag in the other. Huh? Huh? Yeah. That's what we need to get, Doc, is one of those uh, little barrels like the St. Bernard used to carry full of whiskey. <laughs> 
I would flip you off, but we're on line. <laughs> <laughs> Read between the lines. <laughs> You're a turd. Oh, it frees, that frees your hands up for med kits and magazines, man. Oh, my God. And bandages, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was good, man. Uh, God uh, Family Country 101 said your wild hunt books are awesome, DA. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you, you, like thank you so books, much. You need to read the rest of them. Start out the Ragnarok Rising series and just build your way through because not only are those books awesome, the rest of them are too. And well, there's a, if you go to my website, connected. they're all yeah. connected. If you go to my website, daroberts.net, there is a timeline on the website that shows you the best order to read the books in because they are all connected. Yep. Awesome, 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 good stuff. Then you won't get one of those, well, effort if you read the books in order, you know all <laughs> this already. No, I'm still chuckling thinking of Doc with this wooden cask under his chin. That's not funny, man. <laughs> it's not funny. It's freaking hilarious. It is. It is. I'm just trying. I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do mock indignation on that. So oh. yeah. So yeah. Ooh. Only instead of uh, instead of uh, in the Alps, those big Saint Bernards they carried. What was it, sherry or, or something? Uh, brandy. They had brandy in them. Yours would be full of bourbon. Yeah, bullet bourbon. Why not? Yep, It'd be full of bullet. About <laughs> holding over your going. Oh. <laughs> I have bullet here and bullets here. <laughs> so. Oh my God, I'm going to yeah, be chuckling about that is, for a while. I have got to find one of those little little casks and send it to you. And since I'm the doc, I also have the silver bullet. And if you're in the military, you know what the silver bullet is, because you don't ever want Doc bringing out the silver bullet. That is the core temperature checker, mm -hmm. also known as a rectal thermometer. Right up to hoo hoo. All right. So just saying. Doc, you got to take me to dinner first for that one. Heck yeah, brother. Oh, just, my God. I've got to find one of those little wooden casks. We just, we just now. won't mix up the oral thermometer and rectal thermometer. It won't That's make bad. that mistake again. Nope. Only difference is the taste. So, <laughs> what we refer to as a self correcting problem. It's kind of like getting that maggot that uh that slide bite on the on the web of your thumb. That's a self correcting problem. You won't do that twice. You or the that train tracks because you, you cross your thumb over. Yep, you do that on my range. You get a Hello Kitty band aid, so and they know that you have been on Doc's range. Hmm. All right, can you do you have those in paper book, paperback or hard covers? Philip Miller asks. Uh, they're available in Kindle, in paperback, and a lot of them are in hardcover. Uh, the last few releases aren't out in hardcover yet, but I do need to get those done. Uh, but uh, And some of them are currently available in, in uh, audio, uh, and we're working on getting more of them out in in in, in uh, audio as well. Dave buys his leprechaun medic. <laughs> David, you're in my class. Like <laughs> Turn it at your neck right now. <laughs> he doesn't like that and he's going to grab his shillelagh and have words about it that's right damn it bobby uh uh da any available coloring books for my nieces and nephews you know i've never thought of of doing coloring books because my books generally aren't for kids uh a little too graphic a little too violent but uh I, you know that's might something that you know, might talk to my well you would certainly keep his interest is, but then again, there'd be none of them pictures colored because he'd eat the crayons. There's that. Um, yeah, I might talk to a couple artists I know and maybe we'll see about putting together a cryptid coloring book. That's a pretty good idea. Uh, and Pete says, I've been listening to the show and flipping my scallywag knife open and closed open the, almost the entire show and just uh, discovered a small cut on my thumb. Fortunately, I do not need my Dark Angel Med Kit. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. Uh, we love oh. having you merry band of miscreants on board with us. Uh, we appreciate y'all hanging out with us on our, uh, on our shows. Uh, if it wasn't for y'all, uh, and your support, we would not be here and it'd just be us talking amongst ourselves, like a bunch of knuckleheads that we are. Snowmobile in the coloring book. 
my old lieutenant uh, James Jenkins here. He says I told that joke for a long time till I dated a nurse, and she said one's blue and one's red. That's true. That's true. Don't get the colors mixed up. Tastes kind of funky. <laughs> uh, uh, God family country says my six year old grandson loves Bigfoot and would love a cryptid coloring book. Let me let me talk to a couple artists I know. Yeah. That might be something if I can get a few artists to to submit the artwork, uh, either either on the cheap or or even free. Maybe we could do a coloring book and just donate the proceeds to the Twenty Two a Day Foundation. I still need to finish compiling that that recipe book. I've got a bunch of recipes, but I don't think it's really enough for a full book yet. Yeah, I still have some mine. David By says, I know I just volunteered to be the demonstration dummy. He did. He did. Doc's going to get him. I, he did. I looked at him and said, you might feel some pressure. Uh, Doyle me. Thorne says, uh, DA, I bought your new book three days ago, and I'm still waiting for a delivery date. Looks like it's in high demand. Good for you. Well, thank you very much. Amazon's been slow as heck lately, too. When I release this newest book, usually when I upload a book to, to uh, Kindle Select, uh, the KDP.Amazon, Kindle Direct Publishing is the platform I use to, to publish the books. Usually when I upload it, I've got the book out within 24 hours. But I went back and forth with Amazon for over a week before they finally got this one re released. I don't know if somebody dropped the ball uh, or if they're you know, shorthanded or you know, I don't know what the deal was, but it never takes that long. It, uh, it usually only takes about 24 hours to get even the, even the print edition out. But it was like nine days from the time I uploaded it before the time they finally up, uh, 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 approved it. Little Patty says she'd buy a coloring book. Well, we might have to see if we can do that. I might have to talk to Ryan Paul Tremblay and a few other guys I know who are really talented authors, uh, artists, and and see what we can do about getting a cryptid coloring book out. I think that'd be okay. kind of neat. Okay. Hold on, dude. <laughs> the Rangers needing to go? He's got to go poop. Ah. Well, folks, we are uh, at the two-and-a-half-hour mark, and we've been kind of heading toward the, uh, the, the good night of the, at this point. And I know we're pretty notorious for what I refer to as an Ozarks good night. Um, the head of I still need to send my recipe. But uh, folks, if you've got an encounter story of your own, or you just want to share, you know, share information you have, or if you know you've got a question, or 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 just want to you know make a comment on 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 one of the shows, uh, or if you have a suggestion for a topic that you would like to see us do. Uh, send us an email at daroberts at daroberts.net. Let me put that up there on the, uh, where's it? There we go. Shoot us an email at daroberts at daroberts.net. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. And if you've got a show idea suggestion, we'd love to hear it. If you've got an encounter story you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. Uh, so just reach, reach out and let us know. And uh, we'd love to hear about you guys. Judy Davis has loved the new book. That is awesome. I can't wait to get... Uh, dark uh, Dark Frontiers out because I think it's going to be really, really popular. I'm really proud of this book. Uh, Kirst says, DA, question for you about your books. What's the best way to buy them? Like what site pays you the most for them? I assume Amazon takes a cut of your book. Amazon takes a pretty big cut no matter what you do. Um, best way uh, is probably, well, where I make 95% of my sales is on Kindle. Um, but the, 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 the absolute best would be if you saw me at a at a convention because then I don't have to pay Amazon pay the Dane Guild so to speak I just had to pay printing costs, um, so, but Amazon gets you two ways on the uh, on the print editions they charge you for the printing and the shipping and then they charge you for for their chunk chunk of the book so if you sell a print edition Amazon gets about seventy percent uh, whereas if I sell a uh, Kindle edition I get about seventy percent so it kind I guess it kind of balances out. Um, but yeah, the bulk of my sales are in in in, in Kindle. Um, uh, Stephen Bishop says, "Would that also be a good place to send videos of possible sightings?" Absolutely. If you've got a video you want to send to us, send it to that email. Uh, we'd love to check that out. Uh, see if I'm missing anything. Uh, big thanks to the uh, the mods uh, tonight. You guys kicked ass. Uh, moderators did a great job. We really appreciate you guys. Um, 
also want to say a big thank you to all the, pay, uh, the all the folks over at the Patreon community, all the patrons, uh, and their their support goes a long way. Believe me, it uh, it helps out with a, with a lot of stuff. Uh, and there's a, there's short stories available over there that are available nowhere else uh, right now up on the Patreon community. There's a, a number of of things over there for you guys who would enjoy to read uh, if you like my book. So hope you guys you go check that out. Uh, we would love to have you be part of the Patreon community. Um, and again, thank each and every one of you guys for spending time with us. Uh, as a reminder, there will not be a show this coming Wednesday night. I am going to be out of town, uh, but we will resume again at our same bat time, same bat channel a week from tonight on Saturday. And uh, we'll have an all new show for you then with, with you know, the same group of idiots, but maybe a different topic that we might actually stick to. <laughs> maybe. No promises. Maybe. So, again, folks, you know, Scallywag and Dark Angel Medical, veteran-owned community, uh, veteran-owned companies, support your veteran, veteran communities, veteran, veteran-owned companies. Uh, reach out to your first responder and veteran friends uh, because they 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 have been through and seen a lot. And just checking in on them from time to time will likely mean the world to them. And who you never know, that one time you say, "Hey, I was just thinking of you and wanted to let you know I was thinking of you and I care about you," that alone might be what gets them through the day. Uh, so until it, that 22 a day is zero a day, let's all let's all reach out to our, our first responder and our, our our veteran friends, and let's help let's help stop veteran suicide because it is it is a horrible statistic that it, that is something that that we have to deal with. Um, sorry, I got a little maudlin there. Um, AAO says. Um, Says DA, look forward to getting your books. My husband is knife. Awesome. I'd love to hear what you think. You know, feel free to let us know. Uh, Mondox says, looks like I'll be listening to the Wild Hunt book on Wednesday. Um, I, sorry, I promised my wife I'd take her out of town, so we're going to be out of town on Wednesday. Um, but again, folks, thank you guys so much for spending time with us. We uh, we're you know, well over 4,100 subscribers now, like 4,132, I think it was before before the show even started. Uh, the show is is growing so much, and and we, we see new faces in the chat every night, and we are so thrilled that you guys have chosen to join us on this this exploration of this mysterious this mysterious cryptid uh, cryptid search. Um, we appreciate you each, each and every one of you guys so much, and welcome to the DAX DAX Machination. Uh, onward and upward, folks. Onward and upward. Uh, so big thank you to to Robbie. Uh, Robbie, before we go, where do we uh, where do we find your channel and tell us a little bit about it? Uh, we're on uh, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, uh, Spotify. We also have a YouTube channel, What's Really Out There. Uh, as we like to say, come to coin the phrase, DAX mocking a lot. Same kind of stuff you hear here in the big, long, really extended version where we can really get into it and break it down. We do a lot, a lot of shorter stuff on there. Um, for the most part, cryptid related. Uh, there's some paranormal and some uh, extraterrestrial stuff mixed in there. Uh, you know, it's just we just we we like to try to find out what's really out there. We like to take that approach of uh, you know if we can figure something out and fig and then we do. You know, we're not trying to debunk anything. We're not trying to prove anything. We're just we're talking about things and seeing what what's really out there so and yeah, appreciate AO so you can find us on all those those uh podcast uh platforms Spreaker iHeart Spotify uh, I believe we're on Amazon now I think and like I said uh we have we have our YouTube channel I'd really love it if y'all go to the YouTube channel and subscribe there because we upload all the the podcasts that, and you know we're up to about I want to say over a hundred subscribers, maybe. So you know, just if you want to go check us out, check us out there. You can leave us comments about it if you want. If you got a show idea, if you got your own encounter, uh, you can also reach us at what's really out there two zero two two at gmail dot com. Uh, Norm, me, and Johnny. Uh, it's just like this, you know. We we aggravate each other, cut up, but you know, just 
talk and tell stories. I got to get DA and Doc on there one of these days. Happy to do it, brother. Just let me know. Okay, then. All right, then. All right, All right then. And it ain't got no gas in it. Ain't got no gas in it. Appreciate it, Stephen. Thank you. So, folks, again, you know, thank you guys so much. None of this could be possible without any without without y'all's support, and and we enjoy you know, spending as much time with you guys. And I, we've said it before, and I'll keep saying it: we don't have fans, we have friends. Uh, so we, you know, this is just like a we like to think of it as like sitting around a campfire, just having a conversation with with friends. And uh, I hope that always stays that way. That's because uh, that's that's what I want it to be, and that's something that I hope it always always remains. Um, so, you know, folks, you know, I, I, like I say, stories are journeys that we take together. And I want to thank each and every one of you for taking this journey with us. So I hope you guys have a wonderful night. We uh, very much appreciate your support and being with us here. And uh, we will see you guys next Saturday night with an all-new show and the same corny jokes. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Catch us again Wednesdays and Saturdays on DAX Machina. A special thanks to all our channel members and Patreon supporters. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe.